Thank you everyone for watching another episode of me talking about issues relating to public transport. Now, I'm going to go back to my main topic, um, aka my real job, aka the thing that made people actually listen to me on public transport and urbanism in general, which is construction costs uh, for subways and other mega projects and the differences there between. Um, so, uh, just a reminder, uh, so this is our table, this is the raw data, which is why it looks not pretty. Uh, this is how you can tell that I made the original version of this table. Um, so, this is the visualization, this is actually good UI, which is why, which is how you can know that I did not make this. Um, anyway, so, um, these will just give you lists of things to click on, so you can probably tell that China's building a lot, so even a small city like Lanzhou has a couple lines, and then in a city that's not very small, let's say Beijing, you have all these options. Um, now, it's not actually that much data, because the constructor, so something very important that I keep hammering about on and on is that we don't have, what is it? So here we start at the line three and we end at line uh, 621. Actually, let me move my uh, head to the other side because there's stuff of mine, because there's stuff you can see on the left side. So um, these are the descriptive statistics if you care. Um, we don't, so this is S, uh, N equals, 620. Um, we do not actually have 620 data points here. Um, we have fewer, and the reason is, um, even though we have 620 projects on our list, and we should have a couple more, there are a bunch of things that are um, to be added, um, that are um, probably going to push us to, I don't know, 630, 640, maybe more. Um, the problem is that uh, the construction costs within the same city or even in the same country tend to be rather consistent. Um, so, uh, the, so the example, uh, the, so let's see, so I have Hong Kong in front of me. It's not a perfect example because Hong Kong has seen a very large increase in construction costs actually in the last uh, the last generation or so, but my understanding is that it's an artifact of the 1990s. So Hong Kong had low construction costs in the 80s, or maybe medium construction costs in the 80s, and then things got worse in the 90s and 2000s. Now, this is line. So these are lines that are under construction or recently opened. Uh, uh, column G is opening year. Column F is start year. Uh, so. Um, we can look at the costs per kilometer, and you might notice that uh, uh, this line, Quanmun, is uh, the Quanmun South Extension, is actually elevated. The others are underground. Let's look at the costs. So that elevated that elevated line actually is setting world records for elevated construction costs. Um, the underground lines, yes, you can see. So there's a lot of variation. Don't get me wrong, but I can actually explain why this is more expensive. Just this is uh, so this line, the one that's the one that looks like it's in New York City. It's so expensive. Um, so, um, Hong Kong line. So that extension is within city center. Uh, so this is the this this is the trunk of the newer line that connects city center with the airport. Um, it's not the same as the airport line, but it's the same trunk as the airport line, and the extension is at the city end. So this is a very short extension, entirely within city center. And I don't mean the equivalent of, let's say, Manhattan. I mean the equivalent of lower Manhattan. Um, so there are usually explanations like this for why things are unusually expensive. But normally, it's so in Hong Kong, it's probably like a billion-ish dollars a kilometer for stuff like West Island. Um, or Shatin Central, which is a very long line. Uh, this is also... This is, a line that includes an underwater component and a city center component, but it's 17 kilometers. Hong Kong does not have 17 kilometers worth of city center. Um, so part of it is central, but also part of it is shut in. 
So this is an example of very expensive place. And these, again, these are not independent data points. Um, but if you can pretty well explain the internal differences in Hong Kong in terms of how central the line is um, and whether it's elevated or underground. And again, Tuan Mun is kind of weird. But, um, and uh, in Istanbul, actually, the construction costs are just as those of Hong Kong are consistently high, those of Istanbul are consistently low. Is that related to Hong Kong absorption into China? No. Uh, Chinese construction. So it's actually the core. Um, so, because, so because I'm just going up the database and I'm looking at things that have a lot of data points, like Hong Kong and Istanbul, right now we're doing China. Um, so the Chinese costs are pretty consistently. Did I go offline? Oh, no, no, right, because they don't have the headphones, the uh, color, and the annoying color thing doesn't um, shut off my audio. Okay, good, good to know, okay. Um, so anyway, the construction costs in China, um, here we're moving between cities, some lines are missing, and possibly most of them um, have all the data that we need. Um, so... The construction costs in China vary to some extent, but they vary within a pretty narrow range, actually. Um, the stated construction cost that you will usually see in the media is a billion yen per kilometer. Um, and you might be able to tell just because this is, here's the... I mean, you, you don't have to believe me on the use of PPP exchange rate, but I'm using it consistently. So if we're talking yen per kilometer, that's actually... All these comparable. So these are lanes that are somewhat less than a billion yen per kilometer. Um, probably more like 700 million, 800 million. Um, China's complaining that the construction costs are rising to the point that it's maybe a billion yen per kilometer. Um, and that was the excuse for stopping building the subways in cities that no longer have them. Uh, but again, you can kind of see, uh, even though, so this is to some extent sorted, I think, from expensive to cheap, which is why the variations are not that big, but the but even with the sorting, the range is not that wide within China. Um, so it's a pretty, it, 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 and again, it's not a perfectly narrow range. You can find, I mean, you, you can see in the data, actually you might not be able to see because I put my, um, let me just make sure, okay, so this is roughly as far as you can see. Okay, so you can see the first half, I got, uh, um, so these are just control, um, the half hidden columns are just controlled, don't mind them. Um, so the range in China is not that high, I mean, it's not actually common for lines to go to like this in China. Um, which line is this? This is, okay, line 8 phase 3 in Shenzhen, I don't know why it's so expensive. Um, and likewise this, this is a, and this is a line that's, uh, entirely elevated, so that's why it's cheaper. Uh, but these are these are not line um, these are old lines, so don't mind them very much. Um, so so the point is that we have hundreds of data points for China. Remember, we have six hundred and twenty. Um, let me actually check. Count if B thirty B. 21, and the criteria is China. What? What is the criteria? I mean, the criteria... Why do I not know this? Okay. 287. So, 287 lines uh, here out of 620 are in China. This is uh, this only includes mainland because uh, the MTR doesn't work like China. I mean, maybe in terms of collaboration or something it does, but the design standards, you can see pretty significant differences um, that there were uh, you, can, you can see the more overt British influences in the 
uh, in, in the way Hong Kong works. So an example that is useful to see is the uh, issue of uh, the the issue of cross-platform transfers. So um, in in Britain, in, in post-war Britain, they started figuring, ooh, cross-platform transfers are good, so let's expend a lot of effort in making sure that we have them. Um, and I'm going to see if I have um, the map of the London Underground. Uh, and um, it should be Carto. Carto Metro London. Pronounced in French because it's a French website that's mostly about Paris. It just figured, why not lose also London? And, and actually use the language that they speak in London rather than pretend everyone speaks French like we're um, fuckwits from 1897. And, um, and if you think I'm joking, um, the um, turn of the century French ambassador to Britain lived in Britain 20 years and deliberately did not learn a word of English and insisted that the entire conversation be that every word be translated, be, be interpreted, even words where he must have known the meaning of after 20 years, like, yes. Um, so anyway, uh, let's look at the Vic. So this is this line. Um, the reason we're going to look at the Vic is that it is a post-war line. Um, so this is, again, it's a post-war thing, whereas let's say the Piccadilly line is 19, um, it's 1906. The, doesn't really matter how they were building in the 1960s. Um, and you might notice that, so first of all, the fact that the line undulates kind of should suggest to you something, which is that the line was built uh, independently of the street network. I, don't, I shouldn't say grid, London doesn't have a grid. Um, but, the important thing, but the important thing is that the line was built uh, um, deep underground, as were the older lines, but the older lines, they thought, huh, okay, we're building deep underground, well, let's mostly go under street. So this is... Um, to a large extent, under um, I think Oxford Street, um, not perfectly, but to some, to, to a large extent. Whereas the Vic, whatever, do what we want. Um, and you can see kind of the same thing with um, Singapore and with uh, Hong Kong. Um, and you might notice that the that all that these are cross-platform transfers. So this line is from 1900. Um, actually, it might be early. This actually might be, yeah. This was. Yeah, this was from the original Northern Line, so this is 1890, actually. Um, I guess Stockwell is the, maybe the um, the boundary. So they built this tunnel in the 1960s, and they expended a lot of effort. No, I do not want to deal with your color scheme. Stop being annoying. The I, I, I should call it the last great British mathematics innovation because it, we have this in Berlin as well. But in Berlin, um, so in Berlin, it's pre-planned. Uh, and also in Berlin, as in Vienna, the transfer is timed. These are untimed transfers. The idea is that the frequency is going to be so high. We're talking uh, on the Vic at rush hour train every minute 40 that nobody cares. I mean, when, when the train is, I mean, in Berlin, they sometimes start to time the transfers at five minutes, and they always tire them at ten. In Vienna, they tire them at five. When you're every two minutes, nobody cares. Um, so they actually managed to get the tunnels around the uh, tunnels of the northern line to have this be a cross-platform transfer. Um, again, so they didn't do it everywhere. So at Victoria, they did, and at Green Park, um, they didn't. But at Oxford Circus, they did. Um, they actually made an effort to make sure that this would happen. Uh, then, the so in Britain, you'll drive on the left. So this is the northbound line, and this is the southbound line. So here they uh, flip. Uh, and why do they flip? So that at Euston, they will have another cross-platform transfer. Uh, and, this w and, uh, and it's going to be kind of wrong way. Why is it wrong way? Because um, you're not trying to cross, because the natural direction of crossing is north to south or south to north, and these lines are opposite orientation, so if you're going via the uh, uh, via the bank branch of the northern um, in Houston, so it's north-south, then you go frip, and, and if you go direct, it's like this, and then if you change cross-platform at Houston to the Vic, because the Vic flips 
at this station is uh, in running on the right, instead of going frip, frip, going back north, which is not where you want to go, you go frip to the south toward Oxford Circus, which is also an important part of central London. Likewise, the other way around. Don't show me this other gun. Thank you. Um, and likewise, here, if you're going here, you're going north-south. Here is another cross-platform transfer, by the way. Uh, I believe that these are the old platforms. And then they built these and deeded one of them back to the uh, back to this line. This is not it, it's not it's called the Northern City Line, and it's technically a commuter rail line um, that's been moving back and forth between being called commuter rail and being called underground. Uh, and uh, then. You, you go here, maybe you don't want to change to the northern city, but you go here, and maybe and then maybe you're changing to the bank branch um, to go to a, to the Angel or something. Um, or maybe you're doing this because you are going to the actual bank and you don't want to have to change a train here from the northern city to the northern city. The point is that they've set this, this up with a lot of cross-platform transfers. Um, and you might expect that this would make the line very expensive. Um, but it actually didn't. The thick line was not uh, especially expensive. In today's money, I believe the cost was 110, maybe 120 million dollars a kilometer in the 1960s. Again, in today's money, so I'm already confirming. The cost explosion of London happened afterward. And so this is, um, even though they've built around this, and this is something that in Singapore and Hong Kong, they've done from day one. Um, so they've built the system around these untimed, but very frequent cross-platform transfers. Um, so this is not something that is ever done in China. Um, and I bring all this up to argue that there is kind of a British way of building, which has been exported to a large extent to Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, there are also certain uh, commonalities between Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, Taipei. Um, Taipei did not learn this direct from Britain. So for example, Taipei builds cut and cover, um, which is cheaper. However, Taipei also has very high construction costs for being cut and cover. Um, this was the original plan, but you can see kind of how the cross-platform transfers are set up here. Um, I think they have a wiki... Yeah, so here they're showing on Wikipedia how this works. It's always multiple stations so that you can change wrong way and right way. Um... So what do I mean by wrong way and right way? Um, let's do this. Um, so what I mean is uh, the, what are they called? The Quantong and Tuanwan line. So Tuanwan, Quantong. Um, they meet at three stations there. So you go FWIP, cross platform FWIP, or FWIP, cross platform FWIP, or FWIP, and then in the middle, cross-platform. Again, it's not unique to Britain, because in Berlin, we don't have multiple stations like this, where you have, but we sometimes have one station, and they also time it. Vienna, same thing. Uh, Stockholm actually has this uh, three-station time uh, thing like this, between the green line and the red line. Um, and uh, it's not timed, but the trains are very frequent. Um, and I'm just pointing out that there are certain commonalities, and again, China doesn't have them. China did not learn how to build subways from Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, It did not learn how to build subways from Britain directly. It learned from the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union did learn from Britain, but that was the 1920s. And the uh, innovation of making everything as far as possible cross-platform is something that London came up with post-war. Um, and by then, there was a vigorous Soviet way of building that is not generally inferior to the British one. So why would so if you're China, okay, you're you're the People's Republic of China, um, you're doing Soviet style industrialization in the 1950s. You're not gonna learn industrial anything from Britain. There's the Cold War. You're gonna learn it from the, you're gonna learn it from the leader of your bloc, which is the Soviet Union. And then yeah, okay, there's a sin of Soviet split, whatever. But by the 1960s, 70s, and 90s, when you're actually building things, you have your own engineers who trained in Moscow. Um, Oh, hi, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks, Frankie. So my point of all of this is that Hong Kong builds in a certain way. And again, and, and by the way, this is a very good thing that Hong Kong is doing. Um, this is a good thing that it's learning from Britain. And Singapore, same thing. The construction costs in Hong Kong and Singapore separately are ungodly high. But um, 
but that's also I think that, I think it's also a British importation, but it's a later British importation. The construction costs of the basic system in Hong Kong in the 1980s were not high. Singapore, same thing. Singapore only really lost its marbles in the 2000s, and I believe Hong Kong either 90s or 2000s. Um, so the point is that we do not have that many data points. Why not? Hong Kong has built many lines. These lines have accreted over time, so we can absolutely talk about extensions. Like, this is the South Island line. It's a reason enough that's in my database. And it's very expensive. Um, or, or various ext um, extensions of lines here, um, things about what they're doing with the East Ray Line and the West Ray Line. Uh, these lines, so this is called the East Ray Line. Um, this used to be completely separate from this, which was called the West Ray Line. Um, they met, I believe, cross platform. I'm forgetting whether at um, Hong Kong or um, uh, or Team Shatway, but um, then they're doing this kind of weird through running as part of the Shati into Central uh, the Shati into Central link. Um, but um, or they're, or they're just when they've renamed from uh, West Rail Line to Wenma. So it's a system that's changing, and part of the and part of these changes are in our database. If the reasons not, it's just that they're all Hong Kong. They're all the same design, which can be seen in engineering. So I just give you an a very stark engineering way to tell that uh, to tell a certain influence, namely uh, a penchant for cross-platform transfers has probably been learned from Britain. We know that it's not probably, it actually has been learned from Britain, Hong Kong and Singapore. In China, they lack this because they learned from something else. Um, and so this is an engineering thing. But, and here's an important part, in addition, we have lots of non-engineering factors, and they um, are responsible for costs. And so even though we have 200-something um, we have, we have Chinese lines, they are not 200-something independent data points on cost. These are more data points on the costs of the same thing, which is Chinese subway construction. Which again, it, um, in most of our database, it's a little bit less than a billion yuan per kilometer. Um, I, believe, I mean, they're complaining that costs are rising and are now actually a billion yuan per kilometer. Um, but at least from before understanding, the main complaint is not costs are rising; it's that the construction in smaller cities has um, low rate of return. Um, the ridership is not high. These systems. Um, are subsidized in the smaller cities. They, they uh, the, the fares are too low to cover costs, and this is East Asia. In East Asia, also not just East Asia, in Asia in general, the expectation is that subway lines should uh, be operationally profitable, as is the case in Japan, in Singapore, I think in Korea, um, in Taipei, uh, the um, MTR uh, is profitable. I think it's only... I think the MTR only started losing money last year because of corona-related ridership dips. Um, but that should not last forever because in Taiwan, they kind of don't have uh, corona. Um, I think the last non-imported case they had in Taiwan was maybe a week ago when it was someone who got corona months ago. Um, and only got caught now. So, the, um, so we have one data point, which is called mainland China. Likewise, we have one data point, more or less, which is called India. We have one data point, which is called Canada, just because the construction cost problems of the various Canadian cities have happened at the exact same time. There are uh, lots of analogies between the problems, the soft problems, mostly with politicization, uh, seem to have occurred roughly contemporaneously, and uh, at least in Toronto and Vancouver. In Montreal, I'm less familiar with the politicization problems, um, so it's possible they don't have them, but the cost history of Montreal is so much the same as that of Vancouver, that, uh, sorry, same as that of Toronto, Vancouver is somewhat cheaper, that it has to be about this. It has to, I've never actually done a detailed dive into Montreal. Um, Marco has not done so either. Um, but so we do not have this many data points. We do not have an N of 619 or 620. We have an N which is most 
the number of countries, and maybe the U.S. can be treated as two countries because New York is different from the rest of America. Um, that's maybe 40 or 50, and a lot of these are just one data point. If it's, let's say, Kazakhstan or something, or Kuwait, uh, a lot of these fall into um, clusters, into clusters of countries that are very similar to each other, uh, and keep learning each other's ideas. For example, the Nordic countries actually have pretty similar construction costs. Uh, I'm going to start hunting all of them here because they're not going to be adjacent to each other. But go on this database. Um, um, the way you do is you click on data. And so do transitcosts.com slash data. And then view and download our data. And when you do that, when you do that, um, you can just... You can play with this yourself. I mean, we're going to add more things. Um, I can tell you verbally, the things that I have seen do not look like they're changing the picture dramatically. I mean, okay, so I've seen the construction cost of something in, wo in wood. Uh, they're lower than in the center of Warsaw. Okay, yeah, sure. Wood is not Warsaw. Um, so, the, um, so the Nordic costs are actually pretty similar to each other. Um, Denmark, so the construction costs in Copenhagen are somewhat higher than in the rest. Not by enough for me to say, okay, let's start the theory of similarity. No, the, the construction, even even then, the construction costs in uh, in Copenhagen are pretty, or at least relatively close, especially now with the cost over under pretty close to those of Stockholm um, and, and uh, Oslo and Helsinki. Um, so the um, so there's maybe the Nordic cost. Again, Denmark might be a little higher than the rest, but um, the so if you have the Nordic cost, you can look at pan-Nordic things. So right now we're doing so one of our six cases that we're doing is Stockholm, um, and in Stockholm, um, because I know that there are all these similarities between the Nordic countries, and these are not engineering similarities. Remember how we told you. What was it? Ten minutes ago about the different about the, the difference, the similarities that you can see between um, how London's uh, design around uh, deep board tunnels and cross platform transfers, how that uh, was exported in a kind of neater way into Hong Kong and Singapore. Yeah, well, this is an engineering similarity, and if you look at the uh, four Nordic capitals: Stockholm, Oslo, Copenhagen, and Helsinki. I'm pretty sure that in engineering terms, they have four distinct metro systems. I mean, maybe Oslo and Stockholm are somewhat similar, but Helsinki is completely different. Um, Helsinki does not have the branching from hell of Stockholm. Uh, I'm forgetting, Oslo might actually even be a pre-metro, it might actually be a Stadtmar and not a full metro, I'm not sure. Um, but it's also a lot less neat than the way that Stockholm metro works, and Copenhagen is driverless. Um, I said branching from hell. Yes, Stockholm. The I will show you a map of. Wait, do I want to click this link? Okay. Um. This is not impressing me very much. I'm sorry. I mean, the lines one and two are not like this. Uh, so yeah, I, I appreciate that uh, Poland uh, is spending all the money that it's grifting from the EU. Very prudently, but the um, but here is how um, the world's uh, or at least the first world's sexual assault capital uh, works. Um, so they're actually doing extensions right now with construction costs that were supposed to be incredibly low and due to severe cost overruns are only going to be low. Uh, where they're uh, making the branching a little bit neater and that they're doing an extension of the blue line that has the ghost whip and then another one that is going to take over, I never remember which, one of these three branches of the green line. Um, so instead of going to be two, two, two. Three, it's going to be two, 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 two. Actually, it's going to be two, two because they're also doing a branch that goes out of Wooden Plum and the Green Line that goes first. 
Um, and they're going to call it the yellow line, but it's a branch of the green line. Uh, so, branching from hell, as I said, the core um, frequency is very high because I think off of peak it's every 10 minutes per branch, and then during the daytime when it's not the summer in which ever in which case everyone is on vacation um going to spain and thinking that everyone there is lazy because they go to a resort town and it's a resort town it's not madrid uh um and, and so normal times i think they do some extras so it's maybe a train every three-ish minutes in the core um and yeah, no, no, the branching on line three, is, no, no, the, the branching on line three of Warsaw Metro is fucking terrible. I'm just saying, I mean, what, so don't get me wrong. Stockholm is doing branching like the right way. So all of the core capacity is there. And even though this line looks a little bit weird, but um, which it kind of is, but the part that's they're about to be branched out goes like it, it branches out of wooden plan, which is this one. It's not actually that kinked. It's not actually that kinky the line. It's gonna be pretty um it's gonna be pretty straight actually from um I think Afghanistan, which is around here, going to City Center. Um so the so, so when I say branching from hell, I don't mean that it makes me hate whoever drew this map. It makes me appreciate whoever drew this map, however, oh my god, so much branching. Um, and they don't do that in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, there's a little bit of branching, but Copenhagen is a smaller system, much more city center focused. Um, Copenhagen actually is one of the first cities in Europe to have had an S-Bahn. Um, they built the s -talk. The s dog has been running since the 1930s. The, ter the term s talk is actually an importation of German S-Bahn from the early 30s, around the time that Berlin said, this is U-Bahn, this is S-Bahn. So in Copenhagen, oh yeah, we're doing the same system. We're like, I mean, maybe we don't like that Germany has just elected this guy with a severely ugly mustache chancellor, but I mean, surely it can't get too wrong, and we like their engineering. So Esteban, Estog. Um, so the point is that in terms of network design, or in terms of engineering, like the way they're building, there are very few similarities between the various Nordic countries. Um, or, 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 might, or in terms of uh, um, train size, actually. So in Stockholm, the trains... Let me actually see if I can... Uh, are we putting the length of the train here somewhere? Platform length, okay. So I'm going to actually work right now. Uh, oh, right, I'm not going to work because I already did so. Um, we're talking about platform length. Um, I believe this is 200. This is definitely 140, the um, subway extension. So in Stockholm, the metro is 140. Um, in Helsinki, I'm not actually sure. In Copenhagen, if I find it's going to be a lot short of, I think, 40 or 50 meters. They, um, so the engineering in Denmark is done the Italian way. So um, small, so tiny um, trains uh, that are driverless, so the frequency is very long, so, so the frequency is not very long, the frequency is very high, the, the headways between the trains are very short. Um, would NYC subway not be worth branching from hell? Yeah, no, NYC subway is, um, so, so you know how hell has different layers, like, um, uh, like, like, like there are the different circles of hell, so like, Stockholm is in a certain circle, and so is Warsaw, and New York is, like, right there at the, like, innermost circle, uh, where, uh, the, where you have, like, the frozen, uh, devil, uh, and, and, uh, and you have, uh, and you have, um, Judas, uh, and you have Judas right next to the devil, that's where the New York City subway branching is. Fun fact, by the way, Judas Iscariot, um, that's the anglicization of his name. So Judas, you can guess, it's probably the name Judah, Yehuda. Um, but Iscariot, um, what is it? in Hebrew? It's Ishkariot. Um, Ish means man of or person of. Um, Kariot means something like towns or shires or uh, and uh, uh, but 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 but, to, but in modern Hebrew. Yeah, not biblical Hebrew, post biblical Hebrew, modern Hebrew, Kirya, the Krayot is the region that is just the suburbs of Haifa. 
So Ishkoyot today would mean something like someone from the suburbs of Haifa. So this is Judas from the suburbs. Um, yeah, I mean, Kariot just means the towns. I mean, Kiryat just means town. It's not a specific place. It's just that today, in modern-day Israel, the suburbs to the north of Haifa um, are uh, uh, all named Kiryat something. So the entire region is called the Kariot. Um, yeah, we should rate more things by sending them to different circles if, of Dante's Inferno. Now, you might notice that um, I have read Inferno many years ago and therefore do not remember the names of the circles and what they represent off the top of my head. Unfortunately, not long before I read Inferno, I read the Planescape uh, source books. Um, and uh, Planescape, in imitation of uh, every mythology on Earth, thrown in together into this weird alignment system, uh, has nine circles of the equivalent of hell, which is Bator, uh, and unfortunately they don't match. Um, so I do not. So, this, for example, the river Styx follows through different circles, and I never remember which is which. Uh, again, important things. Uh, wait. Is it like all PO being shitheads? Because I'm pretty sure nobody in, in, in I'm pretty sure nobody in Warsaw uh, votes peace. Weird. Yeah, I, I mean there is so there is a lot of politicization. I know in Canada and the US and the US at this point it's all about a specific mayor because um, things are not decided purely at the local level anymore. But in Canada, um, could be mayor. Or it could actually be a provincial government. It's a big problem in uh, both Ontario and BC. So anyway, my point is, engineering-wise, no such thing as Nordic. However, again, maybe I've been blabbering for almost 40 minutes about these kind of preliminaries, but remember, we have a theme for today, which is construction costs, specifically soft construction costs. And from what I can tell, on everything involving soft issues, the Nordic countries are like one country. Um, and... Ugh. Um, yeah, why is PO not better? And by better, I mean capable of um, defeating Duda. Um, so anyway, the point is, um, the kind of process, as far as I can tell, between the various Nordic countries is very similar. There are some differences. Um, there are some differences in the risk allocation, for example, but there are some fundamental issues that are the same throughout the Nordic countries. So... We're studying Stockholm. That is our case. However, maybe I've been talking. Maybe I'm talking to someone from Oslo, and I know that there are similarities. This person might even point out subtle differences between Stockholm and uh, and Oslo, between Sweden and Norway, that make it very clear that these are not real differences. And in, in the same kind of way that you know, people who went to Oxbridge um, drone on about how Oxford and Cambridge are not the same in ways to make it very clear they're the same. Or people who went to Harvard and Yale think that these are two completely different universities rather than basically the same kind of thing. Um, so it's the same way with Sweden and Norway. It's actually a very common theme in uh, social discourse in both Sweden and Norway. It's doing these obsessive comparisons between Sweden and Norway, or sometimes they also throw in Denmark or, or Finland into the mix. Why are you like this? Why can't... Like, would you like Emmanuel Macron to, like, come in and also be your president? Would that be easier for you? I mean, I'm pretty sure he wants to be president of all of Europe, but, I mean, I'm asking Poland if it consents to do that. Oh my God. Yeah. Yes, your left is okay. Four people in Poland vote for the left. Like, I mean, the primary, like, component, right, of the anti-peace coalition is PO, right? Um, he used to share a king with... Wait, when? When did Poland have this personal union with France? 
I felt like the Polish Lutheran Commonwealth was always like very like Am I missing something? Huh. Oh okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, not really. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Anyway, so um besides the fact that peace sucks, um the um, so my point is that in terms of institutional differences within the Nordic countries, there are very few. Um, it's not to say that there aren't any. There are some. Um, so I believe that they... Um, so there's this kind of meme that design build is more modern than design build. It is a false meme, but it is a widely believed meme among people who think international means hopping between New York, London, Toronto, Sydney, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai. Um, and so in Denmark, they actually use design build, um, per, like, so Eno actually went to Denmark for, for a week during their, uh, during their, uh, cost, uh, comparison. And what they, uh, and, and they found that, uh, Denmark is using design build for, for this kind of, it's viewed as more modern. It's like a newer system. It's from 20 years ago. So they didn't have time to learn design bit build back when people didn't think that selling your countries, that selling the state to the highest bidder is good government. Um, whereas in Stockholm, so so one of the things that I heard, for example, from Turkish contractors about Sweden, um, is that in Sweden, they're very stubbornly sticking to not design build. So they call it a build contract, um, which is not, it's design bit build. So for people who do not know, um, design and build are two different things. So there's design, aka let's say I'm an engineering uh, firm, or maybe I'm I, maybe I'm a private sector one. Let's say Acom, Jacobs, uh, Era, Era, WSB, PB, these kinds. Um, maybe I'm not. Maybe I work for let's say, uh, maybe I work for Metro, um, for uh, Milan Metro, which, which does a lot of this in house. Or maybe I work for Madrid Metro, uh, and, and so on. Uh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, anyway, so the, um, so let's, so it, it could be, again, it could be private sector, again, a common these, or, or within the public sector, which is common, although not universal, in rich non-English speaking countries. Um, and then I do the design. And by I, I mean probably it's not going to be me an engineer. It's going to be a, a team of engineers. Maybe I'm leading the team. Or maybe I'm like a 45-year-old senior engineer and they have lots of people working for me. And we're going to do the design of, let's say, an entire subway line. Or maybe a portion of the subway line. Maybe it, maybe a, maybe in private sector, but it's subdivided between di different contractors or whatever. So I design the subway line or I design the subway station. Um... That is design. So I, I make the blueprint. I say, okay, uh, this is how the station is going to look. Um, it's going to be built based on these. Uh, it's going to be built with these dimensions, um, um, which requires me to be incredibly uh, uh, to, to, to be incredibly sensitive to local conditions, especially local regulations. We're going to say, uh, uh, for example, there needs to be fire safety. So I need to know how fire safety regs work. Uh, and uh, how and uh, what the expected capacity is, and, um, what, uh, and, and uh, maybe big, maybe there are even bigger decisions like train size that I don't have any control over because maybe it's an extension. So I need to make sure that all of this will fit in, and uh, then I produce the design doc. Um, and I say design doc; it's not design doc; it's design doc for size of book, um, like thickness. Um, and um, the uh, and then construction is something completely different. If I'm a building contractor, I'm responsible to taking the tunnel, right? I'm, um, I mean, someone gave me the design. I need to build to that design. Uh, so I need to take the tunnels. I need to actually uh, get the machine to, to get the tunnel boring machine to port the tunnel. I need to do the stations, which are generally going to be cut and cover. I need to do the finishes. Um, and again, I'm saying maybe I'm like the person does all of these, but these are usually broken up between different uh, between different uh, companies, uh, between different contracts. So maybe I only have a piece of this. Maybe I just do the tunneling. 
or maybe I just do the finishes of one statement. Um, there's actually a big debate um, about in government procurement about whether it's better to do smaller, bigger contracts or men, uh, I said smaller, bigger, no, fewer, bigger contracts or more smaller contracts. Um, for a while, I believe that more that more smaller was better, but at this point, I don't think it matters very much. Um, it's kind of weird that people on one side that, that people on one side of this say, "Oh, that other country must have very high." Uh, oh, you're saying the other country has a lot of it has very high costs. Yes, because it's doing the other one, but then it goes both ways. Um, Singapore, for example, I believe does uh, many smaller. And Singapore, recall, has one of the world's worst construction costs. Uh, it might actually have the highest average. No, I think Qatar. No, I think Qatar is worse. Um, so, Sing so nothing is as bad as New York. Um, Singapore might actually be worse than the United States on average because Singapore builds tunnels, and the United States has so many elevated or maybe not elevated, but um, ferry median subways that. If you ignore the, 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 that, if you think that you can um, compare per kilometer uh, a fully underground line, and uh, okay, so this is Singapore. Um, construction costs in Singapore, um, and uh, if you know anything about where these lines are being built, I mean, yes, yeah, partly at city center but also underneath very wide roads where they could just cut and cover things. And yes, it would slow down car traffic um, for, for a couple of years. Um, Singapore has 30% car ownership. Uh, the car owners can stuff it. Um, it's not even a kind of like third world situation where yeah, car ownership might still only be thirty percent, but uh, the but the elite, but they're the elite, which I mean, it is the case in Singapore. But uh, and so they run the government, and the government um, neglects public transportation because of that. It's very common in middle income and low income cities. Um, Singapore, yeah. So Singapore thinks that car owners, yes, it is a political elite thing. Um, but also Singapore has a national policy of increasing transit ridership at the, at the expense of cars. And it's been doing a lot of good things toward that. And, and the model split last time I checked for trips to work in Singapore for public transport was, I believe, 58%. Um, this would have been maybe three years ago. Um, and I did actually look up these numbers in the late 2000s, and they were about the same, maybe 56 or 57%. So in Singapore, actually, it's not like there's a deterioration in transit use. There isn't. Um, even though Singapore has become materially wealthier, like the Singapore, I think the currency in Singapore is getting stronger or something, um, but also wages are rising. Um, the uh, um, and, and middle class wages are rising. If any Americans are watching this, when I say middle class, I mean middle class, not what you in America call middle class, which is every person who's not homeless. Um, so, um, so because middle class wages have been rising, you might expect more car use. And I think there's more car ownership nowadays, but um, the but there's not more car use in Singapore. That's not a thing, um, because the car taxes are still very punishing, and there is a kind of transit first policy. Even though it's not a very walkable city, but but the point is that um, Singapore is the kind of place where I don't think they would morally object to removing a couple lanes of traffic for cut and cover. Um, in the Philippines, yeah, I can see why that's a non-starter. Um, the Philippines, I'm not actually sure how Philippine car ownership compares with Singaporean car ownership nowadays, but in Philippine, but in the Philippines, there's much less top-down control. Um, and uh, so in the Philippines, they don't have the ability to um, just say we're doing transit first. Yes, top thirty percent middle class. We know you like having cars get stuffed. Um, and in Singapore, they actually are capable of saying that. Um, and um, but they don't do this. I can't tell if it's like even like like even that has its limits, or maybe they haven't heard of this because they learned how to do everything deep underground and with um, 
very big cavernous stations, even if they're even if they're cut and covered, they try not to build them in the middle of a road in Singapore. Um, whereas in Sweden, for example, um, they also do deep mining, but um, the when they build cut and cover stations, um, not in Stockholm because the rocks aren't good for that, but in um, but in Gothenburg, in in Sweden, as a political transit first thing, um, they open they will open up the um, lanes of um, car traffic um, for a station construction, um, and they will keep the sidewalks. So the sidewalks will remain functional for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, it's also a gender thing. Women um, walk more, cycle more, take transit more, men drive more. Um, and in uh, Singapore, they will not do the. And in Singapore, even though putatively and judging by results, substantively, they want to shift resources from cars to public transport. Um, they don't do this in construction, unfortunately. Um, and again, I can't tell why. Um, it's entirely possible, just not something they're used to doing. And again, these are people who think international means Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, London, Toronto, Sydney, Dubai. Um, in Singapore, they don't learn about continental Europe pretty much ever um, because they define themselves as Asia and not the West. So if you're trying to think in terms of how we in Asia compare with those people in the West, why would you look very closely into Sweden? Because, I mean, for it, because for us in Singapore and Asia, the West is all one thing. So might as well look at the parts of the West that we are closest to, in, uh, like Britain or the US. I mean, all of our national um, educational elite studies at Oxbridge. Um, not sure about today, by the way, um, but um, certainly as of a couple of years ago, uh, the top two foreign countries for students at Oxbridge were Singapore and Hong Kong. Mainland China, I think, was a very close third at that point. Um, maybe it's overtaking them, I don't know, but um, China population, Singapore population. Um, so the um, so quite so uh, so quite a lot of Singaporeans are familiar with Britain and the U.S. through these ties. Um, and if they think in terms of Asia versus the West, they don't really have any reason to learn from Paris because, I mean, all, on all of the things that um, the Lee clan says that distinguishes them from the West, like the fact that homosexuality is still illegal in Singapore, um, sometimes even enforced, not very commonly, it's not Iran, but sometimes enforced, um, especially if you're poor. Um, then... Uh, they, the, then, I mean, you're constantly told that what distinguishes Singapore from those decadent Westerners is something about family values. Well, France has gay marriage too. So um, you don't necessarily uh, you don't necessarily think very much about learning the differences between Britain and France or between Britain, France, Germany, Southern Europe, Nordic countries. Um, so maybe they just haven't bothered learning this from Sweden. That's entirely possible. Um, so the, so I'm going into things that are construction, but not really, because it's not, it's not an engineering thing. It's just a random decision in Singapore that when they build cut and cover stations, they're not going to disrupt traffic. Um, and yeah, that raises the cost because they need to acquire private land for this. And when you acquire private land, that's expensive at Singapore. Um, and so you have these really high costs there. Um, and likewise, and, 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 and the Nordic costs, uh, yeah, yeah, um, so Singapore and Sweden, I mean, I both, I, I think they're useful to look at, both of them, and we're, again, we're looking at Stockholm, and as I said, those kinds of institutions are very similar within the Nordic countries, um, and likewise, there's also an, a certain institutional similarity within Southern Europe, um, it's not as close. I mean, you can see very big differences between how Italy does things and how Spain does things and how Turkey does things. Um, but there are certain similarities that are worth learning from. Um, and um, just because I know I have a lot of r slash neoliberal watchers. Um, so the person who literally invented, I don't know if he invented the terms, but he invented what it is called the Washington Consensus, um, John Williamson. Um, he, for 
30, 35 years has had a standard answer to everyone who said, well, South Korea had tariffs and it grew, so tariffs are not bad. So here's what he says. Um, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong grew, and and uh, generation earlier, Japan, grew in substantially the same way. Um, so so uh, in terms of uh, um, peak GDP growth, um, per capita growth rates, in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, maybe the sectors, maybe it was uh, a lot of the industrial growth uh, and, uh, and um, a weak primary economy. Um, and um, so it's useful to uh, learn, to, so it's useful to look at the similarities among these places and not at the differences. So South Korea had uniquely high tariffs um, and then Hong Kong had uniquely less than fair government. So instead, it's useful to learn the commonalities between them. Like, for example, all of them had crazy high uh, personal savings rates. Um, and this, I don't know if it is still true of China. It was true of China 10 years ago. Um, again, it, might, it may or may not still be the case. I don't know. I just know the Chinese savings rates from 10 years ago, and they were, yeah, South Korea in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and uh, so, so a lot of domestic capital formation uh, was something that they was stressed, uh, a, a very export-oriented mindset. Uh, so it can be very laissez-faire type of exports like uh, Hong Kong. It can be very industrial policy type exports like South Korea. And you could have hybrids like Taiwan and uh, Singapore. <coughs> or Japan, which was technically very industrial policy oriented, but... Um, the top export of Japan is cars. Uh, that was never a target industry um, for Fermiti. So Japanese industrial policy uh, picked consumer electronics as the main winner, um, which is why the big conglomerates like uh, Sony, um, Panasonic, and so on, are, um, if you've heard of them, it's probably because of uh, household appliances and consumer electronics. Um, but cars were kind of like the weird, ugly duckling of that system. So this is why they never were shoehorned into the same character into the same character system. Um, and to, and so Toyota and Honda are on kind of a different corporate system from um, the way the rest of the high-end Japanese economy works. Um, so um, so again, look at the similarities and not the differences. Now as it, now as it is, we have three clusters of very low costs. These are Korea, Southern Europe, which must include Turkey and must include parts of the, the chief parts of Latin America and Nordic countries. Um, also, there's Switzerland, which is I'm not I, I don't I don't think you can actually shoehorn Switzerland into the Nordic system, but I'm surprisingly unfamiliar for Switzerland with Switzerland's construction uh, practices for someone who constantly talks about their rail planning um, and their scheduling. Um, so. At that high level, yeah, you might want to look at similarities, but they're pretty significant differences. So Southern Europe does things incredibly well. The Nordic countries do things, I used to say, as well. I don't think it's as well. It's almost as well nowadays. Um, learn from that, but, there's, but there are a lot of big differences in this. And again, all of this is something that is mostly at the level of soft issues. If you look at actual engineering, if you look at the dimensions of a subway train or subway station, um, Stockholm and Copenhagen are nothing alike. Copenhagen is more like smaller Italian cities like Brescia or Turin than it is like Stockholm. Um, and Stockholm is mostly shaped like itself because um, of the, because I guess, and I mean, we, I want to say Stockholm is actually maybe a little bit like London. So lots of branching, deep underground, uh, mine stations, cross platform transfers, but in basically everything else, there's nothing common to Stockholm and London. So, um, so the soft issues are just completely different. Um, so again, so so these are kind of like the low cost clusters, and likewise the high cost cluster. So that is the Anglosphere, uh, that also has a lot of commonalities and soft issues, even though in terms of hard construction paradigms, Britain and the US are very different. The US. It, so by the way, something. So I'm going to put it, so this is kind of an aside because I was talking before about the idea of internationality and design versus build, but um, in, so in general, people think of like the difference between the U.S. 
in Europe or in between the Anglosphere and the continent. Um, and people who study uh, law in the US and I think also the UK in Complo learn about the difference between English common law and continental civil law. And I don't think people... Actually, if any if anyone with an American or British legal background is watching this, please tell me um, if I'm wrong. But my understanding is that people in Britain and the US don't learn in, com- in, in comparative law. They learn the difference between civil and common law, but they don't learn much about the difference between French law and German law. Um, and, and my contention is that in many cases, um, there are things that are common to the U.S. and France or to the U.S. and France and Germany uh, or to the U.S. and Germany that are distinct from Britain. Um, so there, there's this weird legal thing where France uh, does things the normal way. So it turns out, so in France, if I buy something from you, it's one contract. In Germany and also in English common law, so Anglo-American common law, it's three contracts. I mean, if I, if I go to the supermarket, it's simple enough that it's... Um, reduced to one transaction, but if but for complex things in installments, legally it's treated as three different contracts. I think it's um, the good, the money, and the bundle of both. Um, and uh, so in engineering, so for example, in military things, um, the continental system of uh, of a military is something that France came up with. Um, around the time of the revolution, and then um, there was a lot of dialogue between that, and I mean, dialogue or enemies between France and Germany on this. Um, and the U.S. formed its army on a continental model, so with divisions, for example. And Britain did its own thing with um, the regimental system, um, which was not really designed to find to, to fight symmetric land battles. It was designed to police the colonies, um, and uh, Likewise, with subway construction, for example, New York, Berlin, and Paris, all of them are cut and cover. I mean, not the new lines, but the historic lines. They're cut and cover. London has been doing deep bore construction since the 1890s. Um, there's a huge difference. So, um, so, so with that aside, um, so, so there are these big engineering differences between the US and the UK, but Kind of the, there, there's lots of similarities in the idea of selling the state to consultants. Um, and here's what I mean by selling the states to consultants. There's this mentality that this is more modern. Um, and because globalization is coming from the US, it's coming from like the English speaking world, mainly the US, um, there's this idea that this is more modern and more globalized rather than like learning commonality. So let's say South Korea and Taiwan and Italy and Spain and Sweden and Germany and um and, and France and Chile, um so um so because of there's this idea that design build which means you bundle the design contract and the build contract into one better is somehow more modern than uh, design bid build which is where it's kept separate because historically this might also mean that the public sector did the design. Um, and even when it doesn't, it oversees the design very closely. This is how design that build is supposed to work. Um, so the public sector, if it does not have enough in-house expertise, it buys the design from an engineering firm. It will then own the contract. So the not a contract, it will own the design. Um, and, uh, and, and again, closely supervised to make sure that it's good. Uh, and then it will bid it out to builders. So design, bid, build. Uh, design and build or design build is you skip the bid phase, so one contractor will do both. Um, this is very attractive if you like privatizing the state because it means that you don't need as much oversight. Design bid build works really well when you have in, uh, when you have inside oversight. What's best practice for high capital cost industry corporations? I don't know. Um, so I will for so, so I will mention something about power generation, which is that in uh, India, when you itemize coal plant contracts um, to the um, commodity cost of coal, you will get better results because um, there's less opportunity for um, acrimony between the state and the contractor over uh, 
um, um, over change orders, but um, but I'm not but I'm not sold in saying that in general best practices for coal plants or factories are going to be the same as best pra practices for rail infrastructure. Hell, rail and road infrastructure have somewhat different issues. So design build actually works a lot better for small things that are more commoditized, like a parking garage, like my city, thinks that you need more parking uh, downtown, and therefore we're going to and, and therefore we're going to um, knock down some uh, old uh, uh, office, some old three story um, uh, department store or something, and the, um, and replace that with a six story parking garage. We will contract out the parking garage design build. This is actually something that works pretty well because there's so many parking garages being built. It's basically a commodity. Um, yeah, renewables are even more common. Yeah, renewables are... So renewables, for the longest while, were tiny scale, were things like household solar. Um, and uh, then they figured out you could do utility-grade solar and costs became a lot lower, or utility-grade wind. But even then, I think it's smaller. It's not only smaller than nuclear. Um, nuclear is incredibly bespoke, like in, like talking a count, like a, fi a small, finite number of plants. Um, but, uh, so there actually are some differences. Um, yeah, so in Britain, the costs are high. I think it's a one to two spread between cheapest and most expensive, if I remember correctly. And it tracks infrastructure construction costs decently well. It's just not the one to six or one to five spread that you see for subways. Um, but anyway, so, um, because th so things that are very commodities, you can very easily do design build because there's going to be a very thick market of bidders. Um, things that are very bespoke, you're not going to. So you need a very large market. Um, so let's talk, so let's talk about institutional design for a moment. You need competition. You have to have competition, and this competition should be as wide as humanly possible. Because if you're New York and you only have about ten or twelve contractors that can do business with the MTA, because of bespoke New York things um, that if you ask New Yorkers to change, they will um, yell at you that you don't understand real New York or some shit. Then, um, okay, there are 10 to 12 contractors. They're not slaves to the MTA. They do other things. At a given time, you might only have five or six at a time. And if um, one of them doesn't like you for some reason, uh, you're only going to have three different bidders on something. And, yeah, and if two of them are completely incompetent, um, then you only have one semi-good builder. This builder knows that they're the only good one because the builders know, the, the contractors know which other contractors suck. The builder, um, the bidder knows that the other, let's say, seven or eight bidders uh, are not bidding because they have other work. So by process of elimination, the bidder knows that they're the only good bidder, and yeah, they will just jack up the prices. This is a thing when you don't have enough competition. So you need to have as much competition as possible with contractors. Um, now, small now many small contracts are supposed to be better at this than fewer big contracts. Um, but in practice, I don't think that matters as much as just making sure that a lot of um, bidders can work. This is not everything. So the Philippines does everything I just told you, right? And yet has high costs for other reasons. Um, not insane costs, but high costs. Um, and uh, so in New York, they don't do this because in New York, they're, they think they're special. And in America, in general, they think they're special. So bear in mind that international contractors think that um, design build is better. So the Turks find the build-only contracts in Sweden kind of weird. That said, in Turkey, they don't actually do design build. In Turkey, they do design build. The, this bid and build where the um, in Turkey the preliminary design so in Turkey as in design bid build it's two contracts it's just not design contract bid it and then build contract it's design is sorry it's sixty percent design bid it to hundred percent plus build which is actually a pretty good way of doing this so another thing you want to make sure is you have a lot of flexibility the builders have to have a lot of flexibility to change, the, to do little changes to the design. Again, and, and so in Turkey, it's codified as 60% design, um, and then the, and then you can flexibly go to 100% however you'd like, and that's fine, because the 60% design, I mean, the sort of stuff that is visible to the naked eye 
it's pretty much all up to the sixty percent. I mean, maybe things like uh, um, maybe things that don't matter, like is the bench in the middle of the platform for people to sit on going to be made of wood or metal? That might be a high like final design, but that's the most who cares thing ever to the point that you want to delay that decision for as long as possible just because the commodity prices might change and you want to um, be able to take advantage of having a good price on one specific thing. Um, so, all, but all of the big things like tunnel diameter, things like that, that's that's not just 60%, percent that, that might well be in the 5% design. So the... So, um, in practice, um, the way it works is that it, um, and so in, so in Italy and in Spain, they don't have this kind of codification of 60% design. It's design contract and the builder can make little changes and it's all itemized. So, uh, it's, uh, uh, so if the little changes are being made, then the costs of these are already known. And, the, and if there are little changes due to unforeseen geology, well, yeah, that's fine because it's all itemized. Um, then, uh, and, and then it's just much less acrimony. You don't have the American style litigation problems. Um, so that is, for example, a good practice for soft costs. You just make sure to have, again, lots of competition. Uh, Turkey has it easy because Turkey is run by construction. Um, Istanbul, let me see if I can find this, but, uh, Okay, this is, yeah, I don't care about in Turkey, I care about in, but although Turkey is also going to be very high. Okay, so they're complaining in uh, about high construction costs, but I mean, from relative to what? Okay. Is this going to tell me? Okay. In terms of total floor area, annual starts are 1 million dwellings in Turkey. Turkey is a country of 80-something million. Turkey's population is about the same as that of Germany. In Germany, we don't start, a, we don't build a million dwellings a year. We build, I think, 250,000. Yeah, um, so because Turkey is run by construction, um, by the construction industry, uh, yeah, okay, they're actually telling you the annual averages of housing starts here. 12.6 in Istanbul, even more in Ankara. Um, Istanbul is a city of 15 million people. Istanbul, in other words, built nothing like 160, 170,000 units every year. New York City is a larger metropolitan area than Istanbul to some extent. New York City builds about 55,000. So Turkey has a dazzling array of construction firms because Turkey does a dazzling amount of construction. Um, so housing and infrastructure, Turkey is incredibly yimby um, and this has helped keep a lid on costs. They have a housing surplus in Istanbul, at least as of pre-corona. Um, and what this means is there's a law in Turkey that says minimum three bidders for a contract, um, for, for our infrastructure. If you don't get enough, you have to do a rebid. And that's fine because Turkey has about five trillion construction firms. There's lots of infrastructure being built in Turkey. It's not so much that they get, um, uh, they get more experience because I mean, they do, and that helps. But construction costs in Turkey were low when they started building the metro as well. Um, they used Italian consultants, and then they did some variations in the design, essentially, that made them better. Um, so, the, so the issue is just there's so much construction going on. So there's a thicker market. Um, it's easier to blacklist people who have a genuinely bad track record. And I don't mean small coast overruns. I mean factor of two cost overruns, like over like a, 
And I don't, and I don't even mean one fuck up. I mean a pattern of fuck ups. Um, so because of that, it's just easier. Um, and that helps them drive construction costs down. Absolutely. Um, so that is a soft cost example. This is how they're using competition to reduce the proportion of the costs that is soft. So the hard costs, I mean, yeah, they might also be lower because the contractors are more competent because there's more competition that forces them to be competent. Um, and because they're more competent, they can export their knowledge to other places. For example, Germany. Germany is starting to use Turkish contractors as well. I mean, it's a pan-European market, and maybe they can't bring the Turkish workers here because they're not in the EU. But yeah, they they, they, they can bring Romanian workers um, and, and the and it's, I mean and the so you're gonna have Turkish firms, um, with Turkish engineers and, and Turkish managers and um, and then and then they're gonna use let's say Romanian or, or Polish or, or whatever, um, um, blue collar labor and again that's fine it's all under it's all under the ages of yeah yeah no there are plenty of Turks to already hire in Germany yes but you're not gonna be able to bring new Turkish guest workers it's not 1972 anymore. Um, also, um, I don't necessarily think that uh, the Turks are, at this point, cheaper than the Romanians and the Bulgarians. Um, and uh, so in Sweden, for example, I was told they're not using Turks because, uh, and they're also not using the local refugee population very much. I, uh, what I was told is that they mostly go for Eastern European immigrants. Um, the, the just so at least the way I know how the refugee situation works in Germany is that the refugees never go into like the sort of let's call them uh, jobs that um, typically go to low income immigrants. I mean they do, but not things that interface with the government. So things like working for your uncle's restaurant, yeah, that's something they do. Um, so economic integration, at least in, again, I do not know how it works. I do not know how it works in Sweden, which is very different. Um, for example, a good deal more racist. But in Germany, the way this works is the... So the 2015 Syrians came. They took a couple years to learn German because you need to you know, memorize every single exception to every grammatical rule in German, and there are many. And uh, then uh, they need to get... Um, and then they need to uh, acquire a certification because Germany is a horrifically regulated country in which basically every job um, that is not being a freelance writer requires you to have a certification that you're qualified. So if you want to be an electrician, you need to prove that you're a qualified electrician. Maybe you're an electrician in Syria, that does not matter. So you need to do maybe two more years of internship, uh, not internship, it's going to be called apprenticeship for, for, for the trades. And then you are a licensed German electrician, you're earning German electrician wages, you're no longer on Hartz 4, and you are, uh, and from now on, uh, you are considered German for all intents and purposes, unless you um, commit a crime, and then people are going to remember that you're Arab. Uh, but, as long, but, um, so, I do not know if workers like that end up also in the public sector, but because it's not something that's very easy to just bring in an outside workforce because again they need um it's people who have trained in germany um that's not as much of a thing the, the way i understand it is that the construction uh the, the the infrastructure construction sites here don't actually have a lot of syrians in turkey by the way they do in turkey increasingly they use syrian afghan refugees turkey like many decently rich countries has a lot of immigrants especially because of course in turkey they uh, bring them in, and then there was the whole thing where Erdogan demanded uh, uh, that the EU give uh, that the EU give him some random corrupt goodies, or else he would send the immigrants to Germany. Because the worst thing you can do in Europe is to bring in like a couple hundred thousand of Middle Easterners here. That is the moral equivalent of a second Holocaust, according to uh, ten percent, according to about ten percent of the German population, who are loathed by the other ninety percent, and yet it is treated as a compelling state interest to reduce the numbers of migrants for some reason. Um, so, um, so it's not so it's not like that kind of immigration. It's not like the kind of joke about Donald Trump um, using illegal immigrants um, for uh, work on Mar-a-Lago. It's 
Um, it's again, it's within like an EU system. Uh, so yeah, we do it here all over Northern Europe, even in Germany, which again is not a cheap country to build in. I, hell, I'm told that in Poland, they use Ukrainian and Belarusian um, laborers in construction. Um, and again, in Turkey, they use Syrians and Afghans. Um, so you want a thick market where you actually can bring in outsiders, not necessarily to suppress wages, but just to add more workers when need be. Um, you, uh, so that's definitely a thing you need. Um, that's maybe not soft cost, but just like a good thing about like a flexible labor market. Again, lo- m- much more important is to have way more con- more competition between different contractors. That's a big thing that's helping out in again in, in Turkey. Um, let's see what else. Um, you uh, want to look at how they do um, government relations in different places to do things either well like East Southern Europe or Scandinavia. Uh, I'm going to shift away from Asia because I don't understand it as much as I do Europe, unfortunately. I mean, if I... I want to say if I had more budget, I would hire someone to do a Korean case. I'm actually kind of getting the budget, so... Um, the... Uh, so there's that, and there's the... Um, so Southern Europe and Scandinavia, um, you can do... Eh, things like France and Germany, or you can do, oh my god, why things like the US. Um, so you want probably to, to make sure that you don't have, so in general, so here's something that might actually also be a good model for industrial organization, I'm not sure. Definitely it's for government relations. Any person you need to offer, uh, any person that you need to offer incentives to, to get them to work should be fired. This is the rule. Every person who you need to think about how to incentivize, just fire them. They're not going to, I mean, they'll game all of your incentives. I mean, you want to pay high wages to make sure you're going to get high quality people, to get driven people who are, who, who, who think of this as like a high value career, that they're going to do very good work, that they're going to, um, th- that they're going to uh, try to advance within the organization by doing very good work. But you do not want people who you need to play with incentives about uh, the about metrics or anything like that. If you're not good enough, if you're not a good enough manager to be able to evaluate your immediate underlings without um, kind of without metrics, you're a bad manager, and you should quit and be replaced by a better manager. If the workers will not work unless you. Um, gives them some metrics to game, they're bad workers. So hire better people again. The incentives should be at the level of getting good people in. So you want to make sure that competitive salaries are paid in the public sector, ideally better than the private sector. You're going to save a lot of money. Um, and the uh, and, you, and you want to make sure also that the salaries look like the private sector. So pay them like the private sector, but as well or better. Don't do that. So the Amer- so there is a problem in American government, which is that um, they try to get cute and pay people like how the private sector paid them 60 years ago because of a lot of kind of MAGA, not not political, but institutional MAGA mindset about how the uh, how America used to be great before neoliberalism or something. So you need to so so because of that they keep paying workers in script, like they give them um, they give them for example. Uh, free health care instead of more money. They uh, give them uh, defined benefit pensions that they can retire after 26 years rather than uh, money. Uh, and then they make demands. I, I saw a, I, I just saw a posting for an office job for a technical writer uh, in the US at uh, Wamata. So that's a Washington matter. I saw a posting. Um, let me see if I can find it right now, actually. Okay, I can't find it. Um, so just believe me when I say um, there's a there's a posting that I saw for a technical writer job for Washington Mentor, which is purely doing it, doing technical writing that requires a health check and an agility check to make sure that disabled people don't apply. 
this is a country that has very strong on paper disability accommodation laws and somehow they require this apparently uh, when i when i was when i asked i was told that sometimes they draft the office workers to uh, do some menial jobs, not even as a kind of union busting thing, just as a, uh, you might be used for crowd control. Yes, this is exactly what every uh, engineering grad's ambition is to, to do crowd control. Good luck. Um, so because they try to get cute with hiring in the U.S. government especially, they end up getting, and then the, and they don't have modern HR, so everything takes forever, you end up with very dedicated people who only who are willing to endure all this shit because they really like working for the subway. Um, so you're gonna get the geeks and you're gonna get the drugs. Um, and over time, the drugs are gonna dominate over the geeks because the geeks are gonna be browbeaten into submission by the awfulness of the system. And also, importantly, the geeks. I mean, if you're a if you're an autistic trained nerd, you definitely want to work there. Um, you will like endure like nine months of HR hell for for that. Um, you're not very you're not going to be very good at um, performing man about performing like normal managerial culture in 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 front of the manager who is severely low functioning, elastic, uh, who treats any kind of interest in the subject matter as evidence that you're too detail oriented and you don't see the big picture. Um, yeah, you're not going to get ahead. This is a big problem. So the promotions are also going to be sometimes broken in the U.S. because of that, um, because of that geeks and drugs system. Um, and so the um, so so it's really important to get the hiring right. You're going to get yeah. You want geeks. You want people who are passionate about this. But first of all, you want a lot more of them. Um, so you want people who are very passionate about engineering or about transportation, but um, maybe. Are, but maybe if HR takes nine months and not one month, are going to just leak to the private sector or leak to an adjacent field. Yeah, you want them working for you as well. And you also want very ambitious people who will learn whatever skills they need. And if HR takes nine months and if um, starting wages um, for a planner with a master's are um, $65,000 a year in New York City where with the same education and you're going to work in tech for 110, um, yeah, you're not going to get those people. Like, you want people who will, like, you want, good rule of thumb, you want people to think about working for you if they have a job offer from Goldman Sachs or from, let's say, Google. Um, so this is a planner thing. You want to hire better planners. This is uh, So you want to have a better public sector, and this is something that, so in, it's easier to do in Southern Europe because Southern European wages are, oh my God, how low. But um, the engi- I think that actually the engineers at Aviv, because they get above market wages, might actually get a little bit more money than the engineers at American public sector firms, um, like the, like Amtrak and the MTA and so on. Um, I mean, you need to remember that like the PPP exchange is not one euro is a dollar fifteen, but a euro is a dollar thirty five or a dollar forty, but it's not, it actually might be pretty similar, right? It can be slight advantage to Spain or slight advantage Italy because um, because of above market versus below market wages. Um, and so, yeah, they need to pay the engineers a lot better in the U.S., but that's not the main of the cost. I mean, the main of the cost is that because um, the state has been essentially privatized, um, they're dealing with people who need to be incentivized. And if people need to be incentivized, um, if, if you need to incent people to do the correct thing, they will just you're just incenting them to um, to game your metrics, um, and that's a big problem of this kind of managerial organization. Um, one that, in at least parts of the U.S. public, um, not public, the U.S. private sector have been resolved by just by passing the manager. So since the 1980s, American private sector firms have not been run by managers but by shareholders. Managers work for shareholders. Um, and so when you can't be run by shareholders because you don't have shareholders, um, maybe that's not as good. Um, I'm not sure. And whereas, for example, in Germany or in Japan, companies are run by managers. Um, so they know how to get better managers. And even when you have shareholder capitalism, um, you, you, you can still have good public sector management that's not in conflict. You just need to remember that you cannot treat um, infrastructure construction is like 
where a manager who failed in a generic large um, pri private sector corporation should go. Um, so, um, so, so this so this is one of the soft issues. Again, you, can, you, want, you need to make sure you have good internal managers who want to work based on standards and professionalism, and not through being and, and, not, and not through being like imposed on with various metrics. And this is also how different levels of government have to work together, not with metrics and rubrics. That just sucks. Again, if you're, if you're the federal government and there's a local government, you need to make sure you get the incentives correctly with, just don't ever fund that local government. Um, you can't give incentives to get San Jose, for example, to build the BART extension the right way. San Jose's BART extension, do I still have this? Yes. Let me try it. Um, yeah, so I'm saying San Francisco because it's the Bay Area, but I'm literally calling it a part of San Jose just to make it very clear that this is part of San Jose. Most recent cost overrun is 9.1, so this is a line that's scratching a billion per kilometer. It's not quite 100% underground. It is the first subway built in San Jose. It is under a rather wide city center street. Um, there's a reason I keep saying that the uh, FDA head in the US, who used to be the manager of VTA, aka the agency that's responsible for that. Her name is Nuria Fernandez. I heard her give the clean out of the email panel on construction costs. I do not think she should ever work in this business again. Um, or in the government. Um, so you cannot so someone like Fernandez or, or the people who find her inspiring, you can't give them incentives. Like I mean they'll game all the incentives. No, you just remove them and get people who have some level of professionalism. And this is actually a big problem with the way, so, so, so I promise to talk about the example of the difference between good and bad, and we're talking about two different good things, because as I said, I'm less familiar with Switzerland and a lot less familiar with Korea than I want to be. And then institutional, at, at that institutional level, so I, can talk to, so I can talk to you about Southern Europe and I can talk to you about the Nordic countries as the good versus the US as the bad. So Southern Europe, it's top down. I mean, the, there might be municipal construction, um, with municipal money. This is how historically it was in basically everywhere, I think. Um, but Italy stuck with it for longer. Um, or, or the state does things top down. Or maybe there's a regional government that does things top down. So in Spain, I think the money for the subway comes not from the city, um, but the what is called autonomous community. Spain, you see, um, has a lot of butthurt over whether it should call itself a federal um, state. Now, Spain is, for all intents and purposes, highly, highly federal, but um, it's treated weirdly in, in a constitutional way. So, the call, so they call their provinces, instead of states, they call them autonomous communities, and it's not fully symmetric because some of this... Um, federalism comes specifically from uh, comes specifically from a cultural uh, pluralism, uh, kind of the same thing that turned um, Belgium into. And at this point, it's not even federal. Belgium is this way; it's confederal. Um, so the same way that in Belgium it aligned as um, Flemings versus Wallons, in Spain. The primary issue is that there are certain places that don't speak Spanish and don't necessarily identify with steel. So it's mainly uh, um, Catalonia, um, which very stubbornly sticks to its own language and pretends that it was, and, and the Catalans pretend that they were a center of resistance to, um, uh, to Franco. Um, and uh, likewise, the Basques, um, who sometimes will on things, if I mean, especially historically, if they would not get their way. Um, uh, Valencia, uh, Valencia also has the same issue. I mean, it's the same language as Catalonia. They just call it Valencia. They just call it Valencia and not Catalan. Um, so, so they have this kind of weird asymmetry in their federalism between in that different regions have different um, levels of devolution, but it's highly default with them. Um, although evidently the Prime Minister can absolutely withhold the wages of uh, um, Catalonia's 
uh, of Catalonia's civil servants if he is too pressed at them. Um, this happened with uh, with, uh, with Rajoy. Um, so anyway, the point is that in Madrid, it is a big belief um, competency of the autonomous community. So it's so uh, the map here on Google Earth will show you the first level distinction. This is not the city of Madrid. This is the autonomous community in Madrid, of Madrid, which is roughly coterminous with the metropolitan area. It's rather like Ile de France, for example. Um, and uh, this is six point something million people at this point. Uh, and uh, both the left and the right want to build, and they can kind of compete for who builds more, same as in Turkey. Uh, and the and it's all top down. It's not. Um, and you don't, as I understand, have a lot of interaction between different levels of government. The o the other people's money problem is just not there. Um, and in Turkey, um, the way it works is there are lines that are built by the state, and there are lines that are built by the municipality, and the municipality of Istanbul is also huge. It's uh, the entire metropolitan area fits in there. It's, uh, I think at this point, 15.6 million people, maybe. Um, let me see if I can find you the uh, first level map. Yeah, so these are the boundaries. So Istanbul is from here to here. You see this? These people who are 70, so, this is, so the distance between the historic center of Istanbul and the farthest reaches of the municipality, this is about, um, this is more than Boston to Providence. Um, so Gebze, which is the end of Marmara, is technically not in uh, Istanbul, I guess. But, but the point is that this is a municipality whose span um, gets you to a completely different city um, in, in a higher density country. Like, I mean, it's, again, it's 80, it's 70, it's 80 kilometers. Let me see what's... So I don't think that um, you got from Berlin to Leipzig at 80 kilometers. I mean, the trains are not that slow. So, clear, circle, Berlin. Let's do 80 and see how far we go. Yeah. Yeah, so the reach of the Istanbul municipality, you try to do it out of Berlin, and yeah, you're not getting significant cities because Eastern Germany is not that dense, but you're getting into Poland. You're getting pretty close to like the first significant city you're going to encounter in Poland, which is um, Szczecin. Um, you do it in a higher density area. Yeah. You're hitting Mannheim and Heidelberg out of Frankfurt and Koblenz. Um, so, yeah, this is a vast, it's essentially metropolitan governance. And um, what this means is, so first of all, more centralization is better. It means that you have, for example, in Istanbul, they have politics. There's the left and the right. The left won the mayoral election. Um, the mayor is mooted as a uh, potential candidate to take on Erdogan in the presidential. Uh, and uh, the and I think in the polls he's even winning. Um, and uh, and what is he running on? He's running on the normal like center left like CHP type policy in Turkey. Um, and of course being against Erdogan. Um, so you actually have normal politics at that level, and that helps because it means that you don't get the kind of permanent parties that um, and permanent party machines that can be easily put off that you see in single party um, U.S. states and single party U.S. cities. Um, but even absent that, I mean, the issue is not that there's less political corruption. I mean, it's not. I mean, Turkey is not a low political corruption case. It's just a place where there's no other people's money because there are things that are being built by the municipality, things being built by the state. Yeah, they snipe at each other all the time because Erdogan knows that um, that Imaudu is uh, coming for him and is trying to um, sabotage the city's ability to build. It just isn't working very well, the sabotage. Um, and so the and so the result is that there's this kind of top-down responsibility. Um, and again, it's done, I mean, in a, without like this charismatic leader in, in Spain and in Italy, but still, um, it's a very top-down system. Um, 
Now, the Nordic countries are not like that at all. The Nordic countries don't work top down. The Nordic countries are incredibly decentralized. And I don't even mean it just in the Spanish sense that there are municipalities, there are, municipalities, there are autonomous communities. I mean, um, so here's something that Americans talk about Nordic universal healthcare is not, uh, about Nord Nordic universal healthcare systems usually don't get. The universal healthcare is not run by the state, it is run by the counties. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I think there is some kind of net equalization payment maybe for poorer regions, but this is something that is run at the regional level um, with state regulations and so on, but the um, people making sure that um, there's going to be a public hospital and so on, for, for, and there's going to be payments for uh, to make sure that you're not going to um, pay high co-pays if you go to the doctor, that's not at the state level. That's um, A lot of that is actually administered at the regional level with regional tax codes, so in Green and Fold County. Um, and so um, the construction is done by a mix of the state, the county, and the municipality. Usually it's the, the county and the municipality, but the municipality might contribute a lot of money to this. And here's how it works. It's not an American style granting process fundamentally. I mean, there are there are competitive grants, but the traffic administration. So, so in Sweden, it's called traffic um, verka. The they're the civil servant of the Minister of Transport. Um, what they do is they themselves are experienced in construction. This is a fundamental difference with the U.S., where the top people, um, where the top people nudge but never do things themselves. In Sweden, they can do things. There are state projects. For example, anything that is commuter rail is a state, I mean, in Stockholm at least, it's a state project. For high speed rail, it's a state project. So they know how to contract, how to procure a mega product. Um, so if you're, let's say, uh, so, so let's say you're um, Vestra uh, This is It's this giant region, which is uh, the region for Gothenburg, for Göteborg. Uh, I say the region for Göteborg. I mean, Stockholm County is the metropolitan area of Stockholm, fundamentally. Um, um, that's very much not the metropolitan area of Göteborg. This is the metropolitan area of Göteborg. I mean, it's not a suburb of Göteborg, right? I mean, I mean, Boros is not a suburb of Göteborg. Um, uh, Trollhattan is not a suburb of Yutibori. Um So there's this project that is being built in Yutibori, which is um, a regional rail tunnel, because as you can see if I zoom enough, in Yutibori they have a terminal uh, station. So, so this is a terminal. Um, so you can't do regional rail through running there. So they're doing something, I think it's going around like this, where they're going to do regional rail through running in Yotibori. And this is not a project of the traffic administration because it's not part of any kind of national intercity priority. Um, because, I mean, if they want to build intercity trains, I don't care about through running at Yotibori, right? I mean, Yotibori is not between two places. Um, Unless these two places are suburbs, right? I mean, Yotibori, I mean, what is it? Between, okay, so a line from Malmö, maybe Oslo goes through Yotibori, but I mean, you're never going to care very much about the running from Malmö to Oslo. Um, it's international, it's, I mean, Malmö is not a very large city, so, you, uh, so you're probably actually going to just run a, a train between Malmö and, and Yotibori, and then between Yotibori and Oslo, um, and then time of transfer. Um, if you care that much. Um, and it brings to Stockholm. I mean, this is Stockholm. You're not, you're not going to go flip, flip. You're going... I mean, right now, they, you go flip and flip, and the high-speed line that they're planning forever is going to go flip, flip, or flip, flip. Like, to, to make sure that they're building one common trunk for as long as possible to reduce costs. Um, so... Would that not be uh, um, Schreppenham? I should maybe stop pronouncing them like I live, like it's uh, like it's Sweden. The word Schreppenham is literally how it's pronounced in Swedish and not in Danish, where it's Schreppenham. 
Uh, and if i sounding like I'm underpronouncing the letters, this is just Danish. So between Schreppenham, Malmö, yeah, sure, yeah, can do, yeah, can do Schreppenham, Malmö, Göteborg, and then Oslo, but um, that's not necessarily a very high performance line, right? I mean, so let's for a sec check how long this is, and remember that this is not high speed rail. So 250 kilometers is from Malmö to Göteborg, yeah. and then up to Oslo it's 500 ish. Um, yeah, you can upgrade the line, but these are not very large cities. Um, yeah, yeah, with ship and all it might be, but I mean, it's still not that great. Um, so it's again, it's the same distance to Stockholm, roughly, but Stockholm is vastly bigger than Oslo, and it's the same country, which I think matters a little bit. Um, and there's, I mean, yeah, okay, here in between you have Yotevori, but here between you, but here between you have Lynch, I think. I mean, Lynn shipping is not a major city, but it's not not fine. Um, and so, um, and this also you get to get to Stockholm to to, to Schaffenhaut to Copenhagen, you the capital of Denmark. Uh, yeah, it might be like four and a half or five hours, and that's annoying. But um, but it's still the two largest Nordic cities. Um, so it's just smaller is the thing. Um, so that's just not as good. Um, so you probably so probably it's going to be enough to time to, to again time transfers in Yekaterinburg for people who care. And um, so so the point is that the run through tracks in Yekaterinburg they're just regional rail, and that's fine. Regional rail is an important thing. Um, so it's a project that's not for the that Traffic Verkat is helping fund, but it is fundamentally a project of the county. Um, so here's what it would what would be done if this were America. The county would attempt to maximize state funding and would therefore mention about 12 things that the line is good for. They would also explain to you why it is a key uh, uh, art, why it is a key transport artery between um, Schopenhauer and, Mal and Malmö on one, on one side and Oslo on the other, just to maximize state funding. Um, the, it's where America, it will not be the traffic administration, it will be USDOT run by generic managers um, who uh, can't call bullshit on things at that level. Um, and then the goal of the county would be to just, or maybe it's the state if it's America, would be to maximize state or in that case federal funding. This is not how Sweden works because the traffic administration can build things itself. It's not very interested in building this, but it knows that it's part of a urban priority for Sweden's second largest city, so why not help? And then they will, so the point is that there is negotiation. So th this is kind of the, the issue of Nordic decentralization, and this thing that I keep telling, like, trying to explain to Americans, is that when you don't do top-down control, there has to be feed forward and feedback, where there's going to be negotiations between the various stakeholders, and the stakeholders have to be professional stakeholders. So, um, um, and then Karen, these people. Yeah, you see how I'm putting Gun, Ken, and Karen and these people whose names are not um, Ken and uh, Karen. Um, their name is something McCloskey, I think, these people. Yeah. Uh, so in addition to, uh, so in addition to our uh, Coming up with coming out with guns um, to threaten BLM protesters. Uh, the uh, these people are apparently also nightmare neighbors, as you might be able to. Have. You see, their names are not Ken and Karen. This guy's named Mark, um, and so the uh, yeah, and they're both lawyers, by the way. Um, it's also kind of working class, whatever, uh, and. So these people are not should never be in the loop. Okay, these people are the ones that um, a government official comes and tells you're not in the government, get stuffed. Um, and but so when it's a stakeholder, how large would an independent county state be? I mean, metro area, but remember, American states are big. That's not the problem. Yeah. So the U.S. doesn't have yeah, exactly the U.S. doesn't do proper intergovernmental anything. So. Um, so what I mean by proper government is you have stakeholders, which in this case would be the municipality. The, in, in Sweden, the municipality, 
maybe multiple municipalities, um, the county, the state. And you can and you negotiate and they say and, and the negotiation is always about limiting costs rather than doing a wish list. In the US there's a wish list process, um, in which you ask in which you try to be nice to the local government, you ask them what they want, they give you an impossible wish list of things that they hope to fund through other people's money, and then you try to be nice and fund all of them. AKA the Somerville community path. Which for people who have not read my report, my our report um, um, about Boston. That was a three kilometer bike lane for a hundred million dollars that was funded in the first round of the Green Line extension until it, the costs became so high it got defunded, thankfully, because Somerville figured, uh huh, the state said that they would fund everything. The federal government doesn't know shit. So let's ask for a hundred million dollars for our bike path. Um, Adjacent to the uh, adjacent to the root of the light rail that they're going so this one, and um, because for years nobody told them to get stuffed, um, this was part of the cost overrun of this. Um, cost overrun from already very high numbers, just because they did not because they did because they did a wish list process rather than a process in which at some point a professional engineer is going to say. Come the fuck on. This is a three kilometer bike path. A not necessary for this line. B not shouldn't be a hundred million, but at least one zero from that, possibly two. So the so so the outcome of this is that um, you, you cannot be nice to a local community. Remember, stronger local community, less progress, lower living standards, um, more domination of everyone by petty tyrants. Weaker community, more progress, more social progress, more economic progress, freedom from petty tyrants. Um, now, unfortunately, they have not fully figured this out in the Nordic countries, so they do negotiate with terrorists um, to some extent. Um, and but the negotiations are more reasonable, so they're actually building quite a lot of housing. So something that they do in Oslo is they tell a suburb, look. We know you want the subway so that you can commute to your city center jobs. You're going to up zone and you're going to get to them and then you're going to get the subway. So it's, it's that level of negotiation. Again, it's not, it's not wish list based. I mean, I'm sure that I think it's Fornebu is the, is the one in question. In, in Fornebu, when, when they're building the Fornebu bomb, um, uh, they had to, I think, I think it's this hour that they compelled up zone, even though they're rich and they don't want to, because they do want the subway. Um, so, so that's my main negotiation. It might be more criteria um, decisions again made more by professionals and less by local community leaders. So again, petty tyrants who just extract other people's surplus and destroy some of it in the way. Um, remember, the word "yimpy" did not. Get invented in America, get invented in Sweden. Um, and I keep dumping on Northern Europe all the time. And I keep dumping on Scandinavia over their um, racism and their um, and, and their belief that rape is not rape if it is committed by a white man. Um, but um, they actually recognize that the housing crisis, and specifically of not community leaders, so immigrants and um, young people who are leaving their parents um, and they're actually building a lot of housing. I mean, not building Istanbul levels of housing, unfortunately, and they're not willing to build city center high rises, unfortunately, but they are building housing near the subway, near, near the subway that exists near the subway that they're building. Um, I think, so, so the county is 2.4 million people and they're building, I think, 15,000 units a year, maybe, at this point. Um, so, nothing. So, so not amazingly envy or anything, but better than Berlin, for example, but better than all of Germany. Um, so the um, and 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 this helped. This has helped. Um, I mean, housing prices aren't low, but they're not rising anymore. Um, and the so so there are so, so so again, I don't want to dump on the Swedes too much, but there are limits to how much they are willing to get abused by petty tyrants, and Americans have no such limits. Uh, and this is a problem. So again, no petty tyrants in the loop. Um, anything with community in the name probably should be gagged. 
Um, but municipality, like a large municipality, yeah, sure, or a county, yeah, sure. Uh, labor, of course, important stakeholder. Um, the but also the businesses. So uh, there would be um, the so something like the uh, so, so that would be a very corporate. Uh, corporatist way of saying it. I don't mean corporatist in the sense of large corporations. I mean in the sense of um, you make all the uh, businesses and the industry um, lobby together rather than individually sniping at each other buying individual legislators. So, you, I mean, sometimes it exists in the English-speaking world um, on an ad hoc basis. For example, in New York, it's called the General Contractors Association. They're the business group. And then there's the labor group, which would be um, the unions and probably you want um, fewer larger unions if you can, but I mean, that's, but it's, uh, I mean, craft versus industrial and that's not terribly relevant for us, but you want, but that's a stakeholder. And again, stakeholder does not mean veto point. Stakeholder should never mean veto point. Veto, I mean, again, veto point equals petty tyrant. Um, I mean, thanks, Frankie, you live in Poland. You know exactly what happens to a country that is run by um, petty tyrants who have veto power. And by you know this, I mean the American founding fathers do this in the late 18th century, which is why they reduced the number of veto points for what, from what they thought was inherently moral at the time. They just didn't do enough because they thought like 18th century people aren't like 21st century people. Um... And so, um, about, okay, so the court, you're asking me about whether U.S. states are competent for such long answers. Yes, but individually, yes, collectively now. So their DOTs um, and or transit aid. So, so first of all, there's this mentality in, in American transport activism that DOTs are for highways. So there's always this attempt to silo away transit in other things, which reduces scale. Second, there's the geeks and drags model. Uh, there's the, the there's the geeks and drags model, uh, and again, the drags are the ones who are going to be the political appointees, and the ones who are going to have good rapport with the political appointees. Um, and um, then you're getting the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yes, this is what happens currently, but that's not because there's veto points. It's because Piece are racist. That's not the same problem. I'm actually kind of curious how many um, how many orders of magnitude fewer there are refugees right now than entered Europe in 2015. That is an insult to the British Constitution. Um, I'm not mentioning it. Yes, I'm, this is a deliberate insult. One does not learn institutions from England. Um, yes, they are petty, but also, I, I mean, um, Babish was also petty. Um, peace are petty and also racist, like Orban. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point is... Um, the point before I was um, before I was talking about the partition of Poland is that you want stakeholders, but not veto points. So, you, so at the end of the day, the state should be empowered to tell people now. Um, should we tell everyone now? I mean, in the Nordic model, he can't. In the Southern European model, other people don't get to speak enough. But either way, redu okay. So avoid the veto points. That's important. Um, you want to handle things without lawsuits. That's important institutionally. Um, so in the Nordic countries, people have the ability to file suit, but it's, as I understand it, not as unrestricted as in Germany, let alone the U.S. Um, another thing you want um, is, this is a level of, as an, an institutional level, if you're introducing new regulations, think before you pass the law, because there are certain bullshit environmental regulations that increase the costs of subways that were passed through, like midway through New York Tunnel um, in Stockholm, and this is how the costs exploded. Um, and, and, we're, and we're not talking about real environment regulations. We're not talking about like a higher carbon tax and that made the concrete more expensive. It's 
something a lot pettier. I think the at one point they I think the rule is that they considered the uh the the rock that is excavated as the uh so it used to be just rock that you could reuse and then they reclassified it as dangerous toxic waste which needs to be properly disposed of so that requires uh, them to actually deal with the disposal and is and you might expect rock is uh um and as you can as, as and you can expect rock is very uh heavy so um the dump trucks consume that they would not need otherwise consume fuel and that is carbon taxed and they need to also dispose of it again it's a very petty regulation for all, over 4000 okay so first of all over 4000 asylum seekers over 4000 asylum seekers uh, in germany um i'm not sure about during corona but on the eve of corona entries were 160000 every year the um grand coalition from uh 2017 um put a cap of 220,000, an annual cap of 220,000. It was not reached, um, presumably because of shady deals with Erdogan, but um, but, but, we're talk but over 4,000 have crossed. Um, before Corona, this was a week of, um, this was a week of capped Germany and uh, how much actual Germany? Nine days. Yeah. Um, the only people making it an issue are um, petty racists like Lukashenko or Peace. Um, um, yeah, they don't. Uh, um, it's not just the plain text Um So uh, again, we're talking about. So, 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 so let me shift to immigration for a second, just because there might be analogies here. Um, governments pass dumb laws sometimes, especially when they don't know the people who the law affects for, in this case, immigrants. Um, so there's a law in the U.S., and we also have it here, where um, if you are flying into a country uh, and you are denied entry, then the airline is required to fly you back home at its own expense. Uh, and as a result, uh, refugees don't fly because airlines... So, so because... Um, so, so the so the entire issue of immigration enforcement is that it's always um, privatized this way to airlines or to um, third countries in this case Turkey because immigration enforcement at the end of the day means um, someone's gonna um, wave a big gun and threaten to shoot a refugee family the refugee family obviously did nothing wrong and they don't want the visuals so they want to so uh, so actually the Mediterranean crossings for example. Uh, happened because the private contractor for um, Europe to prevent um, em to prevent refugee immigration from the Mediterranean, aka Gaddafi, um, after um, bombing a couple too many um, pro um, protesters, uh, ended up uh, becoming a good dictator. This was, I guess, late 2011. Yeah, there are about there are about eleven different spellings of this guy of this dude's name. Oh, they're not saying Gaddafi. Yeah, so on um, the twentieth of October, twenty eleven, um, Gaddafi became finally a good dictator, and um, the uh, and as a result, uh, um, that sub because the subcontractor vanished, um, suddenly the refugees could cross from uh, Libya into Europe. So if you hear people about saying, oh, well, NATO bombed Libya, and this is why there are so many immigrants coming from No, the immigrants are basically never coming from Libya. It's not Syria. So the immigrants are coming from farther south through Libya. Um, so in the same way uh, that it's subcontracted to dictators like Gaddafi and would-be ones like Erdogan, um, it is... Uh, and it, literally what, what Lukashenko is trying to do is... To, is saying, give me money and I will be the dictator subcontracting immigration enforcement to you. Um, but for airlines, this also means that they just will not let you on if they don't think you'll get it. So the airlines do visa checks. Um, and this means that this, so the standard way to apply for asylum in a rich country is you enter and then apply. Let's say you're uh, a Haitian immigrant somewhere in Latin America. Your job vanished because of uh, Corona. And uh, you can't go back to Haiti because... Haiti is terrible. 
um, and maybe you're not very safe in Panama or wherever. So you're crossing into the, so you're crossing the border over land into the U.S. And the, so the legal way to apply for asylum in both the U.S. and uh, Europe is you cross the border over land. So I mean, if you if you either fly in, but again, nobody will let you come in as an asylum seeker. Um, so you cross the border over land or wherever you want, and then you find the nearest uh, immigration enforcement station and you identify yourself there. Um, Naturally, the people doing immigration enforcement either don't know that that is the law or they don't care and they will um, treat you like you are an illegal immigrant rather than as someone lawfully claiming asylum whose request may be accepted or denied. This is where you're seeing um, the uh, um, guys on the horses with the whips um, in Texas. Um, so because of all of this jazz, um, asylum seekers, instead of flying from Turkey or wherever, to uh, Germany or wherever, and I mean, we have low cost airlines. I mean, the, the we're talking what it's like what a hundred euros per person to to fly from Adana or wherever to anywhere in Germany, but they can't because the airlines have become have been reduced to um, immigration contractors, um, and so they travel over land, and it is uh, and, and it's uh, and it requires being a lot of money to coyotes. Uh, and this is why um, it's taking them a while to maybe find the best routes, like in the 2015 wave. It was not time to, uh, 2015 was not time to, um, an unusual phase in, let's say, the Syrian civil war was just when um, news of, like, the route into Western Europe um, kind of... Uh, uh, um, Kind of propagated through um, refugee communities that were stuck in Turkey, uh, and that's how and that's how they managed to get in. So yeah, so peace is making this impossible because peace are fucking racist. Lukashenko is racist and also knows that the uh, that like your NATO is racist. So he's saying uh, so he's saying give me money or I will send you a number of refugees that you would not even notice um, if they just came. Um, so, again, so again, when you pass these regulations, first of all, make sure you know what these regulations do. Um, it's not some kind of uh, libertarian doctrine of unintended. Uh, yes, there's currently a fence and a few army units, uh, so you're not applying for anything. Again, peace are racist. Um, Merkel tried to make Tzedeu not racist. She warned them another election because she is not racist. The refugees in 2015-2016 asked, were asked who you were going to vote for if you were, had German citizenship. They all said Merkel. Sedou decided to be racist. When the refugees naturalized in a couple of years, um, none of them is voting Sedou. They're all voting SPD and Green. Thank you very much. Um, um, so the so again, it's regulations passed by people who are hostile to the people that they're passing the laws about. In this case, it's immigrants, but it could equally be like random dumb environmental regulations by people who um, uh, try to do something like quiet climate policy as opposed to just raising the carbon tax. Norway, by the way, is doing really. Well. I mean, Sweden did very well in the 1990s when it started with that, but Norway is currently passing an even higher carbon tax in the new, uh, well, in the new, I want to call it traffic light coalition, but the Greens are notably not there. Uh, Norway coalition carbon tax. Let me see if I can find this. Yeah, so specifically the issue is that um, in Norway, the Greens are not in the coalition because the Greens wanted to also go after oil production. Um, which Norway obviously exports a lot of rather than just consumption. Um, so this is what the government wants to do. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, so they're doing the more standard green thing of only going after consumption or production. The Greens were a little more militant and wanted both. So not in the government. Yeah. The carbon tax is 2,000 kroner uh, per metric ton. Um, it's about $200 in uh, PPP rates. Norway uh, has a very strong currency, see above exports. Also, uh, Norway is 
absurdly wealthy. So, um, high cost, so it's a high cost of living place. So, um, it's actually again about 200, um, which is higher than Sweden. Sweden is 140, I believe. I'm forgetting the Sweden watch wine corner, but it's 140 in PPP dollars. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, as you can see, um, green activists still want more, and instead of uh, raising this in Sweden, maybe they tried to pass some dumb environmental laws that I'm sure made sense to whoever were proposing them, and they just didn't think through, and that's how the cost rose. So you, you generally, when you when you pass new regulations, especially if they're going to be relevant to an ongoing project, maybe it's a good idea to um, price the consequences of the regulation into the cost of the regulation, which I don't think they did in Sweden. Um, and again, it's not, it's not going to be like a Sweden good, Norway bad thing. Like in general, there are, uh, in general, I think with infrastructure, I think Sweden is a little bit better than Norway, maybe. It's just that this specific thing, Sweden goofed on. Um, so you want to make sure to have some kind of dialogue between people passing no regulations and people doing big projects just to make sure that the regulations are not going to wreck things that are already happening. Um, so that that's very important, I think. Uh, um, another thing that's very important is to um, make sure that um, it, um, it, is to make sure that, again you want large groups represented, but not Ken and Karen. Ken and Karen represent two people. Ken and Karen. Now maybe these two people are inspirational to um, the Kyle Rittenhouses and to other people who fantasize about shooting protesters. Um, but they're not actually representatives. I mean, someone who, I mean, so Ken and Karen, I mean, they're Republicans. They spoke at the Republican National Convention in 2020, um, but they're not the Republican Party, okay? The Republican Party, and I mean, who leads the Republican Party? Probably uh, Mitch McConnell. So that's, that's probably a good example. So if you want to do some kind of political consensus, then yeah, is that important politicians in the opposition, you will discuss things with them. And remember, they're the opposition. They, um, they can say yes, they can say no. Essentially, the, the trade-off is if you're the opposition and you say yes, then, um, you, um, then why does the coalition want you? First of all, because it wants the appearance of bipartisanship, um, which is politically popular. Second, it wants to reduce the um, political power of small groups within the coalition, that, uh, in, which was a big problem, for example, in the United States with the infrastructure framework where the um, left margin of the Democratic Party, um, like the squad, opposed the bipartisan infrastructure framework because they were holding it hostage to their priorities in the Build Back Better Act. Um, and so the BIF, which should have passed in July or early August, got delayed until just now, um, because of this kind, because the, because of this kind of um, hostage taking, of which again the squad is at fault. I mean, the moderates have taken a lot of hostages of their own, and they fucked up legislation. That specific thing is not on that. Um, um, lack of minimum wage increase, yeah, absolutely. But um, the BIF delays, not the fault of Matchin. And so you want, um, and so you want bipartisanship, maybe in order to reduce the um, ability of uh, uh, members of your own coalition, maybe because they're ideologically too different. In this case, too left wing, or maybe it's a moderate party that's kind of in a diagonal situation. Let's say they're, uh, uh, let's say you have two dimensional or three dimensional politics and a one dimensional left right, and maybe there's a party that's um, a that wants to be kingmaker like the ultra orthodox party like like the Haredi parties in Israel maybe you want to find ways around them or maybe um, or, 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 um, or in Berlin it's the moderate party right it's PM so there's PT which is the left there's PSDB which is the right and there's PMDB which is the corrupt which is the horrifically corrupt center party that plays kingmaker and therefore it will be very happy to support everything you do as long as you keep funding its corruption. So maybe you want bipartisanship to do that kind of disempowerment. 
Um, and of course, the opposition. So the opposition gives you a cleaner bill um, that will increase your political popularity, which makes it harder for the opposition to go in. But maybe the opposition looks more reasonable. And of course, the opposition can get its own ideological interests in the bill. Um, again, some places can successfully do that. Um, it's not that common, though. In the United States, it's basically like in the United States was the Obama theory of government. So um, in the United States, in the Obama era, in the early Obama era, Obama had the following theory. Um, the Democrats just won big majorities. They have 59 senators and I'm forgetting how many reps, I think 247 out of 435, I think is what they had. And uh, therefore, um, Obama has a lot of margin to pass his legislation. Uh, so the Republicans are not going to be able to block it. This means that the Republicans are not going to be able to block the agenda. Uh, and this gives them, so if they want a less left-wing government, they have an incentive to negotiate um, to put in various Republican priorities into, let's say, the stimulus. Uh, and in exchange, Obama's going to pass all of his laws by enormously partisan margins. He was thinking three to one. Um, so they were talking to moderate Republicans and said, oh, yeah, um, put this in the stimulus. And then the question was, OK, so this means you're going to vote for it. And the answer is, you know, I can't. So the Republicans held the line and, um, did, and uh, did the filibuster everything kind of uh, mentality, uh, and as a result, the um, and as a, and as a result, they denied bipartisan cover. But then maybe they could not put some of their own priorities into, let's say, Obamacare. Uh, um, so Obamacare did things that they that probably it would not have had if the Republicans in 2009 had been willing to vote for it, like the giant expansion of Medicaid. Um, so again, you get ideological. So, so in addition to, so, so you get ideological things in the short run. If the opposite, if you're opposite, again, th that's a valid. Uh, th that's a valid uh, set of people to negotiate with. Hell, the BIF did literally that. The whole point of the BIF is um, because Manchin wanted a bipartisan bill. Um, is they found a lot of Republicans who are willing to vote for the BIF in exchange for stripping. Um, the louder climate aspects of it. Um, so they did manage to shift uh, transport funding from four units car, like 80% car to 20% transit from four to one to about two to one. Uh, zero political, like, like DC insiders who are into green transportation or green anything in the US give them credit for it because they're DC insiders and they know nothing. But um, but this was actually a huge achievement, and they managed to get Republicans to sign to, um, to sign it, and this would have been a big political capital booster. It's just that then they figured, oh, we're passing this, so let's also get the the um, BBB, the one that was supposed to be only Democrats, except that they bickered about it for so long that by then the whole point of spending several trillion dollars in stimulus funding um, uh, stopped being so attractive. I mean, unemployment fell, inflation rose above target. Uh, I mean, if, is inflation going to fall? Yeah, but it's still above target. I'm sorry. So the um, so, so the upshot of all of this is you also want to work faster. So you don't want to um, wait. Until, you want you don't want to pass a giant bill in a year. You want to. Um, so when you build infrastructure, also you want to be very sensitive to changes. Now, changes does not mean some asshole who has VC money who tells you that uh, his invention will change the world. No, it, no, it won't. Um, like Mark Zuckerberg was not telling, was not waving his dick around Boston or around Silicon Valley, around Silicon Valley, telling everyone how Facebook was going to change the world. He was just building Facebook, and then it changed the world. I mean, I think it changed the world for the worse, even um, in the in the longer run. But um, but but he actually built Facebook. The sort of people who um, wave their dicks aren't always dicks. Um, and saying how their thing will change the world. I mean, that they're the scammers. So be good at counter bullshit. Be good at counter at counter grifter. Um, don't. I mean, try to have as little um, surface area as possible for grifters to get in. Which is either just work top down. I mean, if you're a grifter and you're trying to sell your thing to the Spanish state, I mean, the Spanish state is run by engineers. I mean, you can grift them about things that are not how to build subways, but.
not about how to build subways. Um, the uh, or, or if you're doing the Nordic thing of negotiation, again, it's not negotiation with every person who is loud enough to want to get into the The negotiation is between big things, so state and county. Um, and just a reminder, it's a Swedish county. Swedish counties are big. They're much more like, uh, I want to say like, they're not an American state, are there? I think there's, what, 22 of them in a country of 10 million? But they're pretty big. They're the size of a, I want to say the size of a metropolitan area, just that Sweden is not that urban. So metropolitan area in a low density American part. And then something that's too low density to really exist in, let's say, Germany or Britain. But still, um, Vestoy, Etland, I don't know how many people live there. Um, so it's going to be easier for me to put in the name of the city than to remember how to spell Vestoy, Etland. Um, also, Vestra, not Vestra, Vestra, like in Danish. Yeah, so in uh, Vestra, Etland County, how many people live? I think it's about a million. Or maybe even a million. It's one of the bigger ones, but... 1.7, yeah. One of the, so this is big enough that um, it's not just going to be a consistent set of the same family that runs everything. We've called this family. Let's give this family a random name, like Cuomo, uh, or Brown, uh, or Sununu, if you get my draft. And the, or Kennedy. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, the issue is not the U.S. constitutional system. The issue is, I mean... I don't even say the unwritten U.S. Constitution, like the filibuster, which is absolutely in the U.S. Constitution. It's just unwritten. Um, it's random things about how the American civil service thinks civil service ought to work. Um, plus, politicians were petty beyond belief, because if you're trying to get into politics to raise taxes on the rich, to, um, give, to, to increase means-tested welfare, people will tell you that's impossible. And then if you try to pass um, some random... Regulation is going to wreck the market just so that 10 poor people who you met once can benefit, then people will call you a visionary. Um, and so th that's not the constitution, it's just a, like a lot of pettiness. And um, so, and again, it's, not, it's a pettiness that does not exist really in Northern Europe because Northern Europe, um, and I'm saying Northern Europe and not Scandinavia because Germany is not from very petty people. Germany has a lot of NIMBYs, a lot of lawsuits. Um, which, again, this is a self thing that you need to disempower. You need to make sure that NIMBYs are not in the in the loop. You want to make sure that the loop includes, again, big governmental things. Um, again, um, an entire district or county, a municipality, if it's not a tiny suburb, um, the state, of course, um, the business association, the, um, the unions, uh, the opposition, maybe. Not tiny NIMBYs, and not, not very petty NIMBYs who just want one petty thing. And like, if you're giving them veto power, I mean, remember, they don't care. They, they, they just want their exaction, and there's the, going to be, and if you give it to one NIMBY, you have to give it to all the NIMBYs. It's kind of like chewing gum in class. And so the, um, so the, so the upshot is that, um, you, so, so instead of veto points, again, you want, I mean, if you want stakeholders, you want stakeholders who can influence, but are but can still be, but at least some of them can still be told, no, we're not going to do this. Um, and in Germany, there's too much loss of power for this. Um, but the pettiness does not exist here. It's actually a big thing in Northern Europe that people who are not from Northern Europe don't get because we have not abolished capitalism. We have, but we do have a very large difference between left and right on actual policy issues. Um, I mean, Sweden might actually be the number one country in the world in the difference in immigrant entry rates between left and right at this point, because if the right gets a coalition, then they're probably going to slash migration levels by a very large factor, and migration levels in Sweden are high enough that that's like that spread is just going to be enormous. Um, but a lot of economic things, like... Um, Um, so I'll get to you in a sec, Bonnie. So the other thing is also economic things. I remember the $200, uh, uh, ton, the 200 corner ton, uh, 
tax on um, on what's it called on, on carbon. That was not there before. So the left wins the election, even in a country with a giant oil oil industry, and the, and it goes from no carbon tax to the world's highest carbon tax. Yeah, that's northern Europe for you. Um, or here, I mean, and we're not even going from an all right to an all left government. We're going from a grand coalition um, in which the, in which it said it was the senior partner to a not all left coalition because FDP is a right wing party, but one but a mostly left coalition, and we're going to suddenly. And we're, and we're going to have, go from a minimum wage that has only been introduced because that's what they pushed for it in the previous grand coalition. And we're going to suddenly have, I think, a 12 euros an hour minimum wage. We're going to, we're going to end up having the world's highest statutory minimum wage um, while having a smaller member in the government who is a, uh, um, who, who is like an explicitly pro-business right-wing party. Um they managed to co-sign this. So here, so you can't, so I mean, yeah, you can be a petty person here who just wants to block things. So I'm um, pointing to your question. Do we have green groups running amok? Yes, we do. Um, but I don't want to call them green groups um, because when you say green, uh, it might be useful to think about the green party. And yes, yeah, some of these groups vote green, but not all of them. The ones who um, stuck the Gigafactory, who, who got the um, Gigafactory that Elon Musk is trying to build in Brandenburg, um, the one who got it stuck in the year of legal hell. Um, those people are not green. Those people are eco-fascist. They're they're pro. They're Bavarian conservatives who are enamored with um, IFD and are suing um, because they dislike that the factory is going to employ Polish workers. Um, so yeah, we have random NIMBYs. The random NIMBYs sometimes are. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, it's usually a bunch of professional. Compl- yeah. So here we have the professional complainers. Actually, the uh, expression. So the expression "organization before electronic, before concrete" actually comes from a certain from from NIMBYs. It's. I mean, the, the Swiss planning maxim for how to build more. It's called electronic before concrete. The part about organization comes specifically from Munich area NIMBY. So Bavaria, it's very NIMBY. The NIMBYs there don't generally vote green. You, I mean, if you're voting green, if you live in Bavaria, and you're voting green it's because you live in Munich or Nuremberg and work a middle class job that is not um, polluting, um, like in tech or something, and you're and you think that um, cis who are homophobic, um, racist shitheads, which they are. Um, that's that, that's how you're voting green in Bavaria. So the NIMPIs in Bavaria have their like, their own eco fascist party called an ecological democratic party. So anyway. Here is the here's how Munich looks. Um, stub and terminal, not a problem because it's the end of the country, um, it's at the corner of the country, um, and a subsidiary terminal that you can get to from the east without having to go frip. Uh, and because the trams going from here to city center were stuffed in the uh, 60s, they built and opened in 1972. They built they opened an S-Bahn tunnel which goes frip like this. Um, so for uh, urban and suburban trains, it's not FRIP. It is FRIP. That's very nice. But it is uh, because it's nice, it is the most crowded thing in Germany. There are, I think, 900,000 users per week day in this one tunnel. Um, Berlin doesn't do that. Berlin, I think each of our three trunk lines probably about 400 a day, maybe. And... Uh, I mean, you need to go to Paris to get things that are this busy. And um, so they have this variant of um, LZV um, for, for the signaling that lets them run in a train every two minutes at rush hour, which is basically unheard of for commuter rail. I think it is done on like one line in Tokyo, the Chuo line, and then it's done on, uh, and, and then it's done where, uh, in Paris, actually, it's done on the, BD tunnel, uh, which doesn't have stations. Um, and it used to be done with A before the dwell times forced them to get down to a train every 2.30 rather than two minutes. Um, uh, Warner, are these commuter trains, uh, I guess Meitetsu, but are these, but are these like branched commuter systems that do it on two tracks? Because in Tokyo, um, they, because in Tokyo they're not, and again, except the Chuo line in Tokyo, when you have a train every two minutes, 
that's on the um that's on the Maranochi line. The Maranochi line. What do you mean? They're single track, and, and the Maranochi line is uh, um is a separate two track system. Um, so the like like separate from everything, and that's how they get very high frequency. I think also. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Double track, and they do it twenty every two, and they actually do thirty trains per hour. That's impressive, because in again, the trial line is twenty eight, I believe, um, without the running, um, which was imp which is especially impressive that Paris does. That. I mean, you see, I mean, Munich. I mean, something you're mentioning in the same breath is with Paris and um, Tokyo and um, and, and the Osaka region, and I mean. Let's compare the size of Paris with the size of Munich. That, that one of these is not like the other. And anyway, so this is a very crowded line. So they're building a second one, and that's taken them forever to even make the decision because the costs bother people, and with the delays, the costs rose. The expression "organization before electronics before concrete" was by people who thought that this is a bad thing, and uh, instead, what they should do is try to bypass city center to run more trains like this. Because um, if you build too much uh, or, or run like this, because if you build too much stuff to city center, then it's going to lead to over-concentration of jobs in city center, and that is um, a negative environmental thing, um, run generally by people who think that American cities have skyscrapers, so they must have a lot of job concentration rather than the reality, which is American cities have skyscrapers in a five-block radius, unless they're in New York, and then outside of that five-block radius, job density is so low that... Um, the city is not especially concentrated job-wise. Uh, actually, there's a lot of suburbanization of jobs in America that we thankfully don't have as much here. That we thankfully don't have as much of here. So these people who think that job sport is inherently moral and that trains should be... Uh, so they think, oh, well, let's be the more regional system and less urban, and, and less urban one. This is where the expression of organization for electronic, for, for beton comes from. The, again, the, Swiss, the Swiss slogan for how to build things but build them better is electronic for beton. The German one is with the version with the organization is very NIMBY. So we do have this. The NIMBY will have an engineer who's probably a retired boomer who uh, thinks that um, low-tech things are the best and looks down on trends for having built a high-speed rail system. Um, we have that here. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Um, Anyway, so um, so the point is that um, let's not do right with this last one. Um, so the point is that in Germany we have a lot of we have a tradition, maybe not so much adversarial legalism. The important person for the NIMBYs to convince everyone they're serious is not going to be a, a lawyer sending threats. It's going to be an engineer, often a retired engineer, who works as kind of a mercenary for hire. Um, to give second and third and fourth and fifth opinions um, and, and claim that certain things are impossible that happen all the time in Japan and France. Again, it's it, like I'm mocking these as like backward looking because they are and as geezers because they are so maybe less internationalized, so less familiar with the capabilities of trains and the needs of trains in places that don't speak German. Um, and uh, like, like seriously, all the magazines here are in German. I mean, they're, 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 Wealth of information about about how Germany works that does not um, about, and about engineering so an engineering event that just does not exist in English. It's impressive. Um, in Japan, at least, um, they translate their TR into um, into English, so it was much easier. And so the point is that um, you want to avoid too much adversarialism, which means that you should be able to tailor retired engineers, grandpa. It's 2021, it's not 1981. Um, let's get you to bed. And the, yeah, is a very gender term, it's deliberate, never grandma. Um, and um, so we, so, so that's a problem in Germany, which is both a cost raiser for us and a project killer. Um, there are things that are not being built in Germany that at current costs would be amazing to build. Uh, and sometimes it also leads to exactions that increase costs. So again, you want to avoid exactions, you want to avoid surface extraction, you want to avoid community in the loop, so anything with community or anything that's a bunch of generic status actress 
middle class people who think that the state works exclusively for them don't do that. We have enough anti vaxxers and like anthroposophy here to kill all of Europe. I mean the I mean there's a reason that we have the essentially the worst vax rate in Western Europe. I mean the I think the worst I think worst go Greece is uniquely conspiratorial for never having been communist. Unlike say Italy or Spain. And then it's I think Switzerland, Austria, Germany. So same kind of horrific adversarialism with middle class people who think that they are kings of the world. Um so again, so this is a very social thing and it's a very institutional thing that um the idea that the state can just tell people, okay, mandatory vaccination deal. Um I want to say scarce people here, scarce people in France, and then Macron did it, and there was a huge crowd boost there. It's just that people here don't want to learn from Macron because Macron is France. Is Germany doing third dose? I think it's starting. Like I think the vaccines are starting to be available. It's just, I mean it's the issue is not availability, the issue is um the, the issue is anti vaxxers Um Austria's Germany. Oh, Austria's um Austria's Germany, except it feels less guilty about being racist, so they're more overtly racist. Um Switzerland feels feels even less guilty, but then they need a lot of immigration. Oh, oh, but starting to give the worst. I have no idea about um I mean, here again, here boosters are available. Again, in Germany, we don't have an, a problem of availability. And I don't think it's, I don't think there's a problem of availability anywhere in Europe. It's just a problem of anti vaxxers. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even do it, I wouldn't even drop the key on six months just because I think that if you do it too early, it doesn't give you enough protection. Um, but again, that's, again, our problem is not that the vaccines are fading away, and that's where we're very, and, and this is why we are like this. The problem is people are not vaccinated. Um, and again, this is a, this is not a Northern European thing. This is a German, like a Greater Germany thing. As you can see, um, last couple of days we have very we have long cleared the um, maximum that we had the second wave, which was this. And now we're about, what is it, 299 versus 213, so about 40% above end of 2020. Um, the question is entirely, I mean, honestly, the main question at this point is whether, um, when there's going to be a third lockdown, and there is going to be a third lockdown, whether um, whether FTP is going to be, um, is, is going to, Try to make this as difficult as possible. Like this was bad enough, and then it looked like it was getting better, and then yeah. And again, this is not very good, seventy percent. Um, so things are starting to pick up because they're trying to like do very soft mandates with two G and such, but it's very soft. Nothing like France, nothing like Italy, um, and. This is still at very low levels. It should be around maybe here. Like, this was 1% of the national population a day at that peak. And it probably should be there. Um, and yeah, and instead, we're stuck at 70% first dose. You don't, I mean, 70% or like 67% fully vaxxed. That's not enough, not for Delta. I mean, you need, I mean, with the booster, you need, I don't know, 80 something percent of the entire population, not 12 plus. Oh, this is total population. I mean, children spread the disease as well, so that's not, the, I mean, like, you have to include them in the denominator. Yeah, I mean, way too many people just didn't get anything because they're, they don't care. Um, I mean, this is where the state comes in, but this is like why, why, why I'm saying that at some point the state needs to just tell, to tell people, needs to just tell people, no, you're going to do this, you're going to put the job in your, Arm half the world put the jab in their arm, and they're not all um, growing a fourth ear and uh, having a Bill Gates um, chip in them. So deal with it. Um, again, everything like this sounds unthinkable until it's not. And then people might understand that, like 
a tyranny of 30% of the population who don't get vaccinated. Again, less than that because 70% is out of zero plus, not 12 plus. Um, the, 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 I mean, there's still like the, the anti-vaxxers are, are, are a loud minority. Um, so that's very obvious if you go to, let's say, Leipzig. I, I was in Leipzig during a big uh, anti-vax uh, protest um, in which the anti-vaxxers were numerically outnumbered. They were, they were, they were outnumbered by the counter-protesters who we were like wearing balaclavas. And I don't just mean, not in the sense of like even having just masks, I'm talking like balaclavas and yelling um, and yelling something, something anti-fascisti. Uh, yeah, you give people the vaccine first, then you give them papers. This is how it works here. So here people are trying to forge the yellow booklet is the main problem. Um, but anyway, the point is, um, so the point is that sometimes the state needs to be able to tell people now. Um, you don't work based on veto points. Veto points is how people thought Roman democracy should work or how people thought that the Polish same should work. I mean, we have better models, you know, this side of the entire industrial revolution. Um, so please don't do it that way. And, um, and so the, and so this is an, it's not the only lesson, one of several lessons that you want. To either do the institutional arrangement top down like here or with negotiations in which nobody has veto power like here. Um, you want to be incredibly transparent and transparent. So actually, so transparency models are also really important because there's this Anglo idea of transparency in which um, if you've seen the show Yes Minister, it's actually a really good way of, uh, of showing like how um, people who do not want to be transparent deal with transparency. And again, you need to start removing people who are very obviously obstructive. Um, so when the minister keeps asking to be given more information, just give him more and more um, boxes of papers to review so the important ones would just get drowned. Um, and because the because Humphrey is a senior civil servant, is first of all, he knows nothing because he probably passed between departments and second, he's under, he, he's a permanent secretary, you can't remove him. It's not even, it's not even you can, but it's frowned upon in ordinary circumstances, like with, let's say, Sweden's mass murder under Stegner, but it's, I think, actually legally not possible. Um, but, um, so, the, um, and, and you see this also with, let's say, numbers that I've received in the U.S. So, in the, so I talk to people and they give me information in the U.S., um, in Sweden, um, in Italy through Marco, in Turkey through Elif. And the gap between what I see in the good places, so Sweden, Italy, Turkey, and what I see in the U.S. is astounding. In Sweden, I can find you individual contracts, let's say the finishes of a station, or uh, uh, let's say the construction of a certain number of uh, turnouts um, in, in the upgrade of a railway or the electrification of a certain railway or, or things of that at, uh, at that level of detail um, with the cost range. So unfortunately, I've not been able to find the exact cost, only the expected cost range. So the kind of, so that's the, because these are the documents that they put out to advertise this project as a thing for the contractors, so the contractors can see this is a thing that you that you should expect to bid between 300 and 500 million kun or on. And yeah, they can go a little bit outside, but I mean, if ever if you're bidding a billion kun or on 300 to 500, it's very unlikely it will like be read seriously. Um, but if yeah, if costs are rising at 600, yeah, sure. Um, and uh, and the name of the person involved. Uh, and likely the name of the person who's involved in this kind of uh, uh, in this kind of contract uh, that they need to the the government officials under uh, review it. Um, and uh, and again, it's at that level of detail. It's a couple hundred million corner at a time, maybe hundred to three hundred, maybe three hundred to five hundred. I don't remember if I've seen fifty to hundred, but again, it's something at that level, which is again, you know, ten, thirty, fifty million dollars. Um, so again, the level of detail that I would be interested in seeing, but I never see that in the United, and, and I've seen 
vaguely similar things in Italy. I've never seen that in the United States. In the United States, they either tell you the station cost, uh, I don't know, $400 million or something, or they will show you uh, this subcontractor charged us this. This contract included uh, this many widgets, and they cost $600 a widget. It's like never at a level of detail that a human can read over and compare, because that's not viewed as important, because giving information is bad because the state in the United States and also in Britain views the public as its adversary. The public is people who ask questions that, I mean, are, I mean, incompetent people know who they are. So the public is going to ask questions and the incompetent people don't want to answer them. So they refuse, uh, so they refuse freedom of information requests, for example, or they make you go through a freedom of information process. They do that you should actually have to petition and do this kind of red tape just to be able to learn where the government is spending its money. That's insane. That's I, I, that's literally doing a hostile environment against your own population. There's been a lot of training in the US and the UK before they realized that they can just do this kind of pirate shit on, uh, on immigrants. And that's viewed as the normal way of doing transparency through submitting freedom of information requests that you know are going to get in the United States, especially I mean, in Britain, it's better, a little better. Um, when the deal is going to be heavily redacted, all the information you, that you actually want, they will say that's proprietary. Um, and so there's just very little transparency. It's very obvious that um, it's and just very obvious that they don't want to tell you what's going on. So when they do, they drown you. Um, it, it's a little bit like um, Russian censorship because Russia. So so in China, um, there are certain keywords that you're not allowed to like. Like that they will kick you out um, of your WeChat and Weibo accounts if you use them. Um, Russia can't do that. Russia doesn't have enough of a tech brace for that. So instead it drowns the airways with shit. So a million different conspiracy theories. So when the actual conspiracy about how Putin uh, thieves the public's money appears, people will say, oh, that's a CIA op because everyone's an op. Um, like that's, it's, it's Russian flood the airwaves with shit, but for transparency. So you want to avoid that and you want to, Again, and you want to make sure to organize the information in a usable fashion. This is really important. Um, you want to, and again, if it, if it isn't available, there are people, there's a reason it's not available. Find the people involved. Um, make sure they're no longer involved. Um, the, um, so that is... Ah, so, so there's this transparency angle, and you might think, oh, yes, Sweden is very transparent, but Italy? Yes, Italy is very transparent. Italy is not the Tangentopoli anymore. Remember, in the Tangentopoli, remember, um, let, let's look at the Italian construction costs here for a sec. Just, I don't think um, Marco included all of the old ones, but maybe. Let's look. Could be in, probably in Brescia, maybe. Yeah. Okay, I think these are things that I put in after I asked them. Um, so Naples Line 1, by the way, this was very expensive. Um, but then costs in Naples have risen further because Naples is an expensive place to build in. From what Marco told me, it's not a matter of the, of the mafia. From, from what Marco told me, it's just a matter of um, weird soil issues and gets a little less competent than Milan and Rome. Um, this is, by the way, in modern dollars. Um, and this is Brescia. And again, this is, again, Brescia, I mean, Naples doesn't do the Brescia thing of tiny trains, absurd frequency, like absurdly high frequency, but, um, okay, so you don't have the old costs, I don't think, but in the 1970s and 80s, please believe me, Italian costs were $250 million per kilometer in two days' money. For the 1970s and 80s, it was insane. Um, the, the the not Victoria Line, the uh, Jubilee Line in London. Um, that was already when costs were starting to um, spiral out of control in Britain. So the Jubilee Line um, has a weird history. Um, so the way they built it is, uh, first of all. So 
also this bit, like the outer end of Tubuli, you might be able to tell based on like how it runs alongside the mat line that it used to be a mat branch. So this used to be an express mat line, and then it was given uh, to the uh, Bakerloo line. Uh, so it's this one, the Bakerloo. And the Bakerloo was the only line going northwest to uh, southeast serving uh, the west end because the Met went whip to the city and the Met also had problems like being old. Um, so the Bakerloo was actually the most crowded line in London. So they built a relief line um, cobbled together from existing branches and then they started uh, maybe around Finchley Road, I guess. Um, this is where you're seeing things that go from 19th century to much more modern things. Uh, let's scroll it. Okay, so from Finchley. My computer needs to think. My computer complains that it has not been. Okay, so I lost the the mouse scroll, but that's fine. So here, so where were we were here? Um, so they went from here to I don't want to reopen. Um, and they, uh, and you might be able to tell that this is not the 1870s anymore. This is, uh, so this is something that was realigned in the 1930s. It's still not the, this was still um, part of the Bakerloo going there. And then from Baker Street, they went through city center as kind of a second, uh, and this was 1979, and this was kind of a second Bakerloo line. You can kind of tell. Bakerloo goes goes to uh, Water to and just beyond Waterloo, so whip. And then the Jubilee was built like this, so kind of the same as a as a relief line. And the cost was, I believe, 190. Uh, yeah, so the cost was about so the cost was I believe in today's money maybe with maybe in, in today's money not in twenty fifteen money about two hundred million dollars per, per kilometer and look this is a line built from Baker Street to Charing Cross so all of this is central London all of this is underneath all these older lines so this is a line that should be expensive and in Italy it was, and in the, in, in the country that was rapidly becoming really expensive and in Italy it was actually costlier than that in the seventies and eighties because of the bribery the tension topoli. And then they cracked down on the tangent topoli and manipulate, and the cost in Italy fell in half. Uh, and this was a time when rest of world costs have tended to increase. So, um, first of all, you absolutely can um, remove obstacles and then get lower costs. Um, I don't think they're necessarily doing things illegally in the US or UK, which is how they are surviving. They skirt the law very carefully, but you can still, but you can change the law on them, and again, remove bad people. Um, and then, by the way, they, they, if you're interested, then, then from Green, then they closed off the um, Charing Cross bit, and then they just built Rip, and then going all the way to Stratford with four crossings of the Thames. And this is the Jubilee Line extension, which was, I think, maybe in today's money would be, might be even 500 million a kilometer. Um, but again, but um, but again, annoying central London bits, four crossings at the times. I mean, it shouldn't be 450, but or 500, but um, but but the point is, um, so you absolutely can improve your institutions. This is really important, and this means that again, you need to be able to tell people now. Um, if you want to do something that's not your top down, you want to do um two way negotiations rather than the locals apply and the state or the federal government is allowed to put 
arbitrary conditions and require them to do more and more and more red tape. But then the money is given and then it can only be taken in like weird circumstances rather than a negotiation in which both sides come up with a plan based on, again, engineering criteria. So you say that the community needs us, the response is the community is not sovereign. Um, and um, the, important, the importance of this is that it's really necessary um, to avoid the kind of OPM, like other people's money kind of abuse that you see in the United States. Um, it's important to get the transparency better, which in Italy, due to the anti-corruption laws passed in the 1990s, they have. Things are in, in Italy decently transparent. The problems of Italian governance are just not about that at all. They're about other things entirely. Um, some of which are about Berlusconi, although not all. Um, and so, um, the, and, and so, so you say, want to turn to you want to either do top down or Nordic cell feedback and feed forward type system with negotiations, um, with, with multi way negotiations. Um, you want not to have petty politicians in the loop. So if it's top down, several services in Southern Europe, the politicians are petty, but I mean, they never last, so nobody cares what they think. If it's Northern Europe, the politicians are just not petty. Um, if it is the United States, the politicians are in the loop and are petty. Same thing in Canada, and you can see the result. Um, you, um, want, um, you want to have itemized contracts to avoid any kind of litigation with contractors because that's going to wreck things. You want the risk to stay in the public sector, not the private, because you can never privatize risk. You can only increase your own costs. Um, what else? Um, you can, um, so what else? Um, you want a very thick market of contractors. In Italy, because the contractors keep merging, uh, keep having corporate mergers, the state's actually going to take a stake in the largest one to slowly turn it into an SOE. Um, so that's the state building things rather than the private profits. Um, so, so we'll see how that goes. But um, but I think that's happening. So um, again, people think are starting to realize that like that's the right version of neoliberalism doesn't work. Um, and and again, all of these are all of these are self caused Like, I mean, procurement issues aren't going to be seen in how the stations look. I mean, yeah, in New York they use ungodly expensive techniques for building stations with the mining. But I mean, Second Avenue Subway Phase Two is not mined. Second Avenue Subway Phase Two, the two of the three stations are cut and cover. And hell, the Fornebu line in in Oslo, it's mined. The stations are mined. That's why it's so expensive. Except that in Oslo, so expensive means two hundred million dollars a kilometer, not. 1.7 billion. Um, so a lot of it is procurement that's just not going to be seen, which is how people say, oh, wait, they don't uh, they don't try to save money in other countries. Look at how nice their stations are. Yes, they do try to save money. It just means that they're not, it means just not through building shit. Um, and this, again, is something that's, because it's not as visible, people keep messing it, but it's still very important. Um, the intangibles in New York, it was told the procurement stuff doubles the, the cost. Um, there are other things that raise the cost in New York. It's not New York is not two x; it's more like six x, eight x, ten x. Um, but I was told that procurement alone is about half of like, like it's a, it's about a two x cost raise just because of weird New York issues with the contractors. Um, the, I mean, there's this idea that working with the state is so difficult that you always include, include a premium. It's not a 2x premium, but that premium plus rest premium plus whatever. Is London as bad as New York? No, London is better. Um, I mean, so in Britain, there's the concept of the freedom of information request, a.k.a. the government does you a favor by telling you. Uh, so, so it's harder to get sources in London than in New York is the problem, but in London, the problem is that the... Um, but, but in London, the freedom of information request will actually give you decent tabulations. Um, so I've seen actually, so I haven't seen a good tabulation at the, you know, 50 million, 100 million or so, like for, um, um, for Crossrail, but I've seen, for example, 
the actual subway part of Crossrail uh, broken out from stuff like surface electrification, which was which was very important for us because this is this, this gave us decent uh, estimates of the cost of the stuff we're comparing rather than stuff that's bundled. Um, but for example, um, they did not give cost estimates per station um, for that or for Crossrail too. Um, I think um, someone managed to get them to give buckets of stations between the cheapest and most expensive, but without giving exact numbers. That, so there's this problem in the non-US Anglosphere that they think that give, telling you the cost of something that's not already done is uh, a trade secret. So if you want to even know the cost of um, a thing that they're trying to build in Australia, they will not tell you. It's only communicated to the public through uh, media leaks. So now you're turning the media into your subcontractor, and this means that the journalists who are going to get rewarded are, um, uh, are, are the lapdog ones and not the good investigative journalists, and the newspapers go with that rather than... Um, rather than sidelining these journalists as the poodles that they are and uh, promoting people who can analyze these programs and explain the problems and essentially make it very clear that the government doesn't get legitimacy until it communicates things to the public and de in a detail level that the public can actually um, oversee. Um, and uh, and again, again, it's... It's hostile environment in which the view in you know, mentality is essentially that the broad public is the enemy of the state, um, and um, rather than the state is that the state works for the public, which you'd expect that the place like Italy would not do. It's only Nordic. No, nope. Italy has the, the in Italy the state works for the public. Again, in Britain it's pretty hostile. It's better than in the US. Um, so in the US they tell you the at least the top level cost in advance. But number they tell you is, is is pretty fictional until pretty late into the process. There's a lot of exaction involved. A lot of, I mean, in, uh, um, a lot of um, squeak. Like in in America, the squeaky wheel gets degrees, and the mentality that you need is that the squeaky wheel gets replaced. Um, like I, I mean, there's this unwillingness to replace bad things that don't work in the U.S., and this can be um, either sidelining. Literally any, again, remember, any organization with community right in it is probably bad. So sidelining that or sidelining officials will squeak too much. Um, and I mean squeak too much in the sense of making demands after the fact or in the sense of criticizing things. You want critics. You do not want exactions. Learn the difference. This is also important. Um, so, so anyway, that's a London versus New York ratio. Like London, again, London is mostly better. It's just not good. Like you want good you go to places that don't speak English. In Paris, they're actually decently good at this. Decently good. Amazing, but decently good. Um, it's been three hours of recording, so I'm going to just ask if there are more questions. I'm going to give people like one more minute or something, um, and then if nobody has questions, I'll just cut this. It's going to be like, I don't know, three hours of two or something. I don't the word. Three hours of three. It's going to be my longest video in a while. Anyway, thank you all for sticking around with me for uh, for something that 
began, I guess, 40 minutes or, or 45 minutes behind schedule. And um, also, first thinking for, it's almost 10 into the evening right now. Normally, I'm done with these by 7.30 or by 8. So, um, again, if there are no more questions, I can cut this and we can... I, so, I... I do not know whether there will be a stream next week. I do not know whether there will be a stream in two weeks. Um, there should be, but there might not be. It depends on um, certain travel plans. It depends on things like, are we all going to die of corona by then? Uh, again. This is what happens when you have the least taxed country and you know, more or less in the functional parts of Europe. Yeah. Um, I know there's been, like in, in France, they're complaining that they might be entering a fifth wave, but I mean, we could trans. Um, so the US, so Germany has actually overtaken the U.S. per capita. Um, impressive. Very impressive. Um, so let's see. Germany. France. Germany. France. And yeah, even with like this kind of resurgence you see in all of Europe, I guess. Um, we, not, we are not quite number one, but give us a couple more days. Anyway, um, so if there are no more questions, I'm going to cut this. And thank you all for watching. Um, and I will see you maybe in a week, uh, maybe in two weeks. I hope not in three. Uh, for, for another video. Yeah, I remember Austria has, has kind of boxes in Germany. And then Eastern Europe is Eastern Europe. Yeah, thanks for watching. Okay. See you soon.